What is going on, Notre Dame fans? Mike Singer and Tim Hyde for this week's Notre Dame football show on YouTube, Pod Like a Champion, wherever you listen to your podcast. I've been hyping up this show, Tim. I've been calling it the Mega Show in all caps because we are doing something um, that we've never done before with, I think, I, I can't, I don't even remember how many different people we're going to have on here, maybe eight or nine total. Two and a half hour long show. It could even be three hours. Who knows? Um, so we are fired up for today's show. A um, few things to get to. First of all, you know, you guys will often give me a hard time. For, actually, real quick, Tim, how are you doing? Day's going well. You excited for the show? Let's get going. Let's get going. It's game day. Mike, my, my, it's game day. Come on. This is the only thing I've talked about for nine months, so. Do what you got to do. Let's get rocking. It is Ohio State week. Clash of top 10 battles. Let, yeah, let's get going. I got I got enough notes the last eight hours, so let's get going. All right, there you go. So um, lots, to, lots to get to. I believe if you're watching on YouTube Live with us, there's a pinned message about how we're going to handle Super Chats today. Now, you guys often give me a hard time for like, oh, Mike, you, you have the show go too fast. Like, you know, stop sticking to a script. Just... Keep in mind, folks, we have the number one Notre Dame YouTube channel for a reason. So, you know, just let, let me cook. Let me cook. Okay? So for Super Chats, you can post Super Chats, but we're not going to address them live. It's most likely that we're not going to. We might be able to have a little time here and there, depending on who the guest is. But please just know that that's how we're handling Super Chats today. So if you're watching live with us, See the pinned message. It should be on there at least. Um, so that's going to be super chat. So we're going to talk, obviously, a lot about Notre Dame, Ohio State. Different guests today, as I've posted about, um, you know, we're having uh, Mike Gould's be on. Uh, we'll have a special guest on later. Uh, Notre Dame quarterback commit Deuce Knight. Pretty excited about having him on there. Uh, Tyler Horka, Jack Sobel will be on uh, later in the show. Um, so Tim and I will be with you all night. and we're We're looking forward to um tonight's show so um yeah so it's gonna be a lot of recruiting and it's gonna be a lot of notre dame football talk uh previewing ohio state so that's kind of the lineup uh for tonight's show and of course folks we should easily get a thousand likes on this i mean at least a thousand likes so if you're watching live i'm going to tell you all night please do hit the thumbs up on this video and if somehow you have not subscribed yet to the biggest notre dame media youtube channel on the market Go ahead and hit subscribe um, and, and do so. So, um, Tim, I'm going to ask you something. Biggest Notre Dame home game since when? What's what's your thought here? Is it, you know, I, I'll give you my thoughts, but I want to hear yours as a, a as a lifelong uh, Notre Dame fan. Well, I mean, this is, I mean, you got to obviously be honest here. You got to look at the rankings, who you're playing, whatnot. Obviously, some big games. You know, it's, you know, it's funny. You know, the first thing people always think about is 2012 Stanford. Well, Stanford was ranked 17th. So that was, you know, Notre Dame was moving its way up the charts when they did the goal line stand game. But yeah, I mean, without a doubt, USC 2005. USC 2005 was just the buildup, the heyday of Pete Carroll. Charlie Weiss built this thing up too. He was like hyped, ready to roll. You know, he had a heck of a football team coming in. The iconic bus that drove in at USC and thousands upon thousands of Notre Dame fans greeted SC on their Friday walkthroughs and rocked the bus. The place was insane. You know, the whole atmosphere. And then obviously the game itself was electric until the last second. So we could, you know, be brutally honest as Notre Dame fans. Um, I remember Florida State like it yesterday. I was in the Marines and I had a huge house party. Uh, we were living off base and, and I, I do. I remember that like it's yesterday. Remember 93 BC like it's yesterday. So when you're thinking of iconic games, those two, 2020 Clemson's always going to get mentioned because it's number one Clemson. You broke their, what, 36, 37 game streak. The COVID takes away from that, obviously. But even then, the, the student section was absolutely unreal. But 05 SC, 93 Florida State, those are the two iconic games of the last you know 40 years. Yeah, absolutely. Those are the two. Someone mentioned a 2017 Georgia in the chat. Um, you know, Georgia, that's the year they played for the title game, but yeah, they, weren't going into, 
Yeah, yeah. they weren't Georgia that. And I mean, and I mean, and you know, as I'm going quick here, I mean, Notre Dame's coming off a four and eight year, so yeah, you know, they sold all their tickets, and the place was Bulldog Central in the stands. Yeah, I think like looking back, that that's such a memorable big game. But going into it, going into it, that's- it's yeah, like I I think you kind of give an honorable mention to Notre Dame Clemson 2020 um, sure. because it was the, you know, that number one team. Um, and, you know, you have the, the storm uh, or the, the crowd rush in the field, um, you know, in, in, during the pandemic, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's Oh five. Um, or then going back to that, uh, that Florida state game in 93, when I think singer was like two, I was like two months old um, at that point. Um, but yeah, some memorable, memorable games over the years. Yeah, and I, and I, you know, I'll throw this out real quick since we have a few seconds. Is that you know, I'm just going, you know, just just going back to Brian Kelly, 2000, you know, 10 to last year with Freeman's first year. Ohio State's coming in. It's only the fifth time a top 10 team is coming into South Bend, so hasn't been a lot of these in the last few years. So, and obviously they had, you know, Stanford was a top 10 game, but it's not this. Clemson, obviously, Cincinnati was a top 10 game, but that's not this. And um and whatnot. So it's uh yeah, it's it's been a while. That's what I want to talk about is the buildup. It, you know, not what happened, but it's the buildup. The buildup to this is gonna be awesome. The atmosphere is gonna be electric, so I can't wait. Can't wait for sure. And just hope that there's not much red. That's my biggest thing, is uh just no 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 red. We don't want to see much red. Um but at all. off of that, Mike, is I'm just you know, you know. You know, we're going to have Tyler on later and, and, and Jack are going to be with us later. They're obviously in South Bend. I would, I mean, they're passing out all these green things and to make the, the night more green and whatnot. So I'm curious to see how that's going to come. And, uh, you know, maybe they have some inside info on, on how the whole stadium is going to rock that. Yeah, I called Tyler earlier today and I was like, bro, when you come on the show, what do you want to talk about? And that's something he was like, listen, we live in awesome. South Bend. Like, let's talk about it. So that will be a little bit later um, in the show. Speaking of going to great football games, you know, I was in Charlotte's last Thursday night and I was, it, w- it was hot, but I felt very comfortable, Tim. You want to know why I felt comfortable? I was wearing this really nice white bird dogs polo, um, which is a great time to talk about bird dogs. Uh, one of our fantastic sponsors um, at blue and gold. Um, if you are looking for slim fit, it's slim fit, but it's also really comfortable, flexible, and stretchy. I'm a big guy, so those are words that I like to hear. Slim fit's nice, but I need it to be comfortable as well, um, flexible and stretchy. Um, so that's the you know, that's a lot of the shorts they have. Okay, St- they have stylish pants and polos to improve your wardrobe. And then you're going to want to check out, um, you know, their sports. Their sh- excuse me, their shorts specifically fit way better than some of the regular stuff. Um, that you, you might be wearing, which is made of a stiff, restricting cotton. Bird dogs fix this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. Listen here, folks, birddogs.com slash BGI, or you can just enter promo code BGI and you'll receive a hydro flask style water bottle with your order. That's birddogs.com slash BGI or promo code BGI. Um, for a free hydro flask style water bottle. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you. And that is a promise for me. I love wearing my bird dogs. So Tim, since we met back in uh, 2021, I'll never forget this. Tim Hyde sent an email to loose emoji. I want to say it was like January, 2021. Yeah. Sent this long I'll call it an article of an email to Lou. Lou forwards it to me and he says, Hey Mike, just sending this over to you. If you'd be interested in him, you know, for YouTube, um, you know, you couldn't write a lick Tim, but you sounded really smart and you love Notre Dame and you know, football, like this guy would be great on YouTube. And in that email, you said, Hey guys, I really just want to join the show to talk about Notre Dame, Ohio state, 2023. That was, <laughs> You know, Basically. two yeah. and a half years ago. But seriously, Tim, what's your feeling right now? Head, you know, we're, we're, we're what three days away. How are you feeling right now? Oh man, I'm pumped up. I mean, seriously, I'm 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 excited. It's it's Notre Dame, man. It's iconic. It's especially when they're you know going to play in South Bend. This is huge. This is huge. It's Ohio State, and what 
when you, when I say Ohio State, it's they don't play a lot, you know, and you know they had the iconic comeback when they beat you know Ohio State in Columbus, what 1935. And check this out, I I was thinking about this earlier. Is I learned Notre Dame football from my grandfather, and the last time this, this is crazy, the last time Notre Dame beat Ohio State, my grandfather was at Pearl Harbor, so he was hanging out, enjoying some coffee, and then the bombs start dropping. Notre Dame, the last time they beat Ohio State, we haven't had World War II. That's how long this is. So when you see all these memories and D-Days and all these things going across the country each and every year, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. And obviously the, the 95 and 96 games were electric. The 96 game, you know, they had game day in 96 was there. So it's Ohio State, something about them because you don't play them all the time. Obviously, Michigan's a hate it because they're down the street. SC's longtime rivals. You wish Notre Dame, Ohio State would play more because they're just down the street. You got two top five of the bluest of the blue bloods. But what really gets me going is since Notre Dame, since Lou Holtz left, Notre Dame went from number one to four in winning percentage. And those clowns up in Columbus are now number one. Not that they're clowns. I'm just saying that as a little – you know, getting fired up for the for the big game. Now they're number one. So Notre Dame needs to take care of this big recruiting thing, as you know, Mike. It's a mid, it's a Midwest battle. I mean, three of the five iconic programs in the history of college football are all down the street from each other: Notre Dame, Michigan, Ohio State. So it's big. I think it's more big to get so much of the just Notre Dame can't do this, can't do that, can't do all this stuff, and it's it's at home. You got Sam Hartman. You got a six-year quarterback making his 50th career start. It's like, go get it done, fellas. Seriously, go get it. Go get it done. Yep. Go get it done indeed. Yeah. And go ahead and hit the thumbs up on this video if you've not done so yet. Um, I'll go ahead and make a couple of uh, notes since we've had a couple hundred people uh, drop into the, the YouTube live chat since uh, I last mentioned this. So this is going to be like a two and a half hour long show, if not longer. So I know I promised you a lot of really good guests and you're probably like, well, what the heck is it? Just Mike and Tim on here. Just, just wait. Um, in about 10 minutes or so, we have our first couple guests coming on. Uh, I have not announced these guys yet. Um, and uh, partly because um, a lot of Notre Dame fans may not love them. Um, and I'll explain that it, 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 when, when, uh, when it's about time to bring them on. So folks, if you're dropping super chats, just to let you know, and I, I put this in the pin message, since we're on like a really strict schedule tonight, um, dropping super chats, we may not get to them. Um, but Tim and I do have a little bit of time. So we, we did have one, um, from Lotus. Um, he says, Hey coach Hyde, I wanted to hear your feedback on fine bomb saying Tommy Reese was committing coaching malpractice at Alabama. Um, uh, it's been a struggle for Alabama, these first two games, um, uh, or first three games. I mean, uh, the USF of Texas games, of course, I, I know they blew out, you know, someone state Western, but thoughts on this, Tim. I haven't seen the quote. I haven't watched a uh, fine bomb this week. I've been watching way too much Ohio. I've been watching a bunch of Ohio, 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 you know, Ohio uh, state stuff on uh, YouTube. It's been awesome. By the way, the comments and those things. They don't like Notre Dame, so it's pretty. It's pretty. I mean, everyone's predicting fifty-six to seven over there in Columbus. It's hilarious. So, haven't paid too much attention to it. I did not. I, the only thing I watched last week were the were the Tyler Buckner clips, his pass plays. It's the only thing I watched. So I didn't watch the game. I didn't watch the X and O. Didn't watch third, third and two in the third quarter. I only saw Buckner passes. Someone posted on the message board. I watched all of it, and that was it. So. Alabama's Alabama. It's Nick Saban. He runs the show. Whatever's happening, who knows? I mean, seriously, I have no idea what's happening down there. Yeah, I'm rooting for Buckner, uh, well, but he's yeah. I mean, he had a shot, and I think you know from from what I just thinking as, as a coach is you know Milro went out and did it. You know, he w went out there and and uh you know had a great first game. They had some wide open dudes against Texas, didn't get it done. Texas hit the bombs with Quinny Ewers. And as a coach, I think, I mean, Nick Saban was not too worried about South Florida. So I really think he just says, you're going to sit because there was rumors, um, you know, he was pouting during the week. So you're going to sit. We're going to play the two young guys because I guess Milrow was on the sideline. He just didn't play him. So they went with the two young guys, said, hey, one of you guys take it. And neither of them took it. So that's that's kind of what it sounds like moving forward. But. 
They play Mississippi. Wish them luck. We got Ohio State, and that's all I care about. Yeah, Tim, a good way to start the week with Deuce Knight, uh, nation's number 39 overall player, number three quarterback per the on three industry ranking, uh, committing to Notre Dame. Um, and then, uh, yeah, how about your boy, Gerby freaking Lambert, Tim, yeah. um, committing on uh, Tuesday night. Can I ask you which one you're more excited about? Is it pretty equal? No, you definitely go Lambert. I mean, I mean, Deuce is, you know, Deuce is like, you know, 18 months away or something. We got a long way to go. But uh, no, Lambert is just exciting. Just, you know, as we've talked before of him just continuing just that O-line U, bringing in a elite top 50 prospect. I mean, they've been doing it each and every year now, bringing in one just stud national you know from the national ranking so he's outstanding he's just he's gonna be i'm curious to see if he's an early enrollee I, i'm sure you'll find that out because don't think he is. up exactly so if he's not he may have to go the charles jagasaw route and just red shirt and learn which is fine things happen like unless he just comes in and they and he just dominates but yeah. you know that's that's down the road but he's outstanding Fantastic, way more athletic. When you think these big giant guys, he is fast off the ball, unbelievable pad level. He has a low stance. I've already seen some of his senior film. He's a lot of fun to watch. Explosive. He's literally like Charles Jagasaw. They're both twins. You know, they just the way they fire off the ball. And then with Deuce Knight, you're getting a tall, lean gunslinger. And he's like one of those guys that man he's got his upsides insane because you just watch him okay you got to work on that got to work on that multiple things you can see he's got to keep working on and then you're like well he just started his junior year and i'm saying work on isn't a good thing his arm strength is electric he's got some really good accuracy issues uh just solid solid the way he throws the out routes a lot of fun to watch him throw out routes and then he could tuck in and run when need be so with deuce it's stacking cues right Stacking quarterbacks. Not all these guys, you know, it's going to be, they're all going to work themselves out over time at quarterbacks. But if you're constantly stacking top blue chip quarterbacks one after another, which they've done three years in a row, it's it's a good sign moving forward that one of these guys is going to take that ball and lead Notre Dame to victories. I mean, I, I might say four years in a row with the I know uh, you would. best. I would say that. The best quarterback in that 2022 okay. Under Armour All American game, my boy. Steve Angeli. I, I was just sticking with the the blue chips. But I, was then, just trying to, I was just trying to do that. But I hear you. I hear number you. five quarterback per ESPN that year. And then you – so if you include Steve, then you even get to go back to 2021. Buckner was definitely a blue chip. I know. 2020, I know. Drew Pine absolutely I was. Know. I mean, all of those guys under Rummer All-Americans. So, yeah, I mean, of course, you know, that's – the just I'm just talking about on paper as high school. On paper on signing. But, yeah. you know – um, it, it, it is interesting. And, and, uh, a point on night. And again, folks, we're, we're talking a lot of Notre Dame recruiting tonight and our next two guests, we'll, we're going to dive into some Notre Dame commits before we really get into, um, you know, Notre Dame, Ohio state talk, um, is I love the pairing of back-to-back -back classes of car and night. And I wrote about this today at blue and gold.com. Please do check out the site. We got a great deal right now, one dollar for a month if you just want to try us out, um, or if you just want to take a plunge for a year, it's half off the uh, normal annual subscription price. So please do go to blueandgold.com for that. Car, I think, has a really high floor. I don't think there's a ton of bust potential for CJ Car. That's just my opinion, right? He also has a pretty high ceiling too. But Deuce, while I think he has a higher, or excuse me, a lower floor, he's got the highest ceiling maybe of like all the quarterbacks in this 2025 class. So I think that's just a good pairing of the floor and the ceiling to me, like got that one safe guy with the one just boomer bust type guy. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. Is that a bad take coach Tim? No, I mean, well, I mean, I'm telling you, man, the way quarterbacks are, you're just going to just throw them all in the fire and see who comes out. And uh, college football is, absolutely maddening with quarterbacks now. I mean, they're going to, it's going to be crazy. You just recruit them, bring in the best ones you can see how they play out. And then you got, you got that thing called the transfer portal when you need somebody to come in and it's a uh, quarterback recruiting 
it's fascinating because obviously Notre Dame's had two transfers in three years. Do they make three out of four? How does that, it, you know, I'm just saying if it happens, you know, with these guys, but at the end of the day, you said something either a week or two weeks ago when we were talking about all this was, man, you got to come in and be a dude. I mean, you have to show yourself by your sophomore year because yeah. if you're there as a junior and you're still, you know, learning how to throw the curl flat combo routes, you're not playing. So you need to come in as a freshman and a sophomore, show what you could do. So you stick it in those coaches, you know, eyes and ears. So when spring ball comes, you're in the running for that. If not, that's why the portal's there in, in December. And those things are always going to be looked at, I think, moving forward. Yeah, I think Ohio State's quarterback, Kyle McCord, is a good example of what I, what I was yes. talking about. Yes. Doesn't start as a freshman, right, to be expected. Yes. Not as a sophomore. But if he didn't get that starting job as a junior, like he's he's out of there. You know, like that. I think that's just it is. If you're a junior, not starting, you're probably dipping just like Tyler Buckner did. I watched your I watched your interview today earlier when I was, uh, you know, take yep. care of a few things with the Ohio State beat writer. Re- really good. That, that guy is excellent, by the way. Yeah, really sure. like, yeah, listening to him. And you said that, which was smart. It's like, yeah, McCord, if Brown beats him out, you know, boom, he'll take his four game red shirt and move on. But at the same time, McCord came in. He was a backup for two years. So even though they had, you know, Quinn Ewers, you know, a couple of years ago, McCord ended up being the backup, getting those reps, proving he's ready to roll. And that's why the Buckeyes didn't go to the transfer portal because they knew they had two five stars, flip a coin. One of them's going to be there and one's going to leave. So we'll see what happens. Yep. Tim. Um, man. I gotta, no, I was going to say, I got another, you know, just as we're talking about Ohio State, we've got some guests coming on here. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You know, is. Um, 90 seconds. Hey. Why, why this game is so big, why this game is so big is, is since 1994, since 1994, Notre Dame has, has been in 20, this is going to be their 25th time host or playing in a ten, you know, top 10 game. Notre Dame is four and 20 in those four wins, 20 losses. And I going all the way back to 1994, I took out the 93, the last great season, all us Notre Dame fans have been around for, we count that as a national title. Mike. Since 2014 alone, since 2014 alone, Ohio State has 20 wins in 10 and top 10 clashes. They're 20 and 8. 20 wins in less Thanks. than 10 years. So when someone, you know, someone was telling me this week, oh, this won't be a big of upset. They're only a two-point fear. It's a big upset, guys. This is this is commonplace to Ohio State. They play in these all the time. 20 wins in less than 10 years. Notre Dame has four and 30. So it's going to be a huge win when Notre Dame wins Saturday night. And I like how Tim said when. A little teaser there, Mike, a little teaser. So there we go. Okay, there you go. Well, I watched Tim, a lot of film. I watched a lot of film. I'm pretty confident in, night and, uh, in what I'm thinking for Saturday. All right, Tim. Well, I'm going to let you enjoy the boat, which I have noticed that you're on the boat. Someone so, mentioned that in the chat. It must be a game. It must be. A big night. Tim's back in the boat. So, yes. It is not unnoticed. So, uh, we're going to get Tim back on here in just a little bit um, as we bring in our first guest um, for tonight's show. Um, but let's go ahead and hear from uh, one of our sponsors for tonight's show. Um, and that is, of course, uh, GameTime.co. Folks, not .com. It is .co. I want to talk to you about the ticket buying process. It can be stressful at times. I mean, you got to find the event you want to attend, and then you got to get the seats you want, and then you got to go through that whole ticket purchasing process. It can be stressful, but not with GameTime.co. It shouldn't be stressful, folks. You're going to uh, head to the website again. It's .co, not .com, GameTime.co. It's a fast and easy way to buy tickets for sports, music, comedy, and theater near you with killer last-minute ticket deals so you can relax and get hyped for all the fun that you're going to have. And when you use that promo code, BGI, you'll get $20 off your first purchase. Uh, and best thing, they guarantee you'll get the lowest price or they'll refund you 110%. You don't need to plan months in advance since they have deals right up to game time. Snag the tickets without the stress with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use promo code BGI for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Use promo code BGI for $20 off. Download game time. Today, last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right. How about we bring on Cody Belair, former scout uh, recruiting office guy with 
was it Texas Tech, Baylor, LSU, I believe, were your last three stops before coming to on three? Yeah, man. And sprinkle a little Texas A&M in there and you got all four of them. So you're good. <laughs> okay. So this is my friend Cody Belair. He is uh, in the on three rankings and scouting department. Um, like I said, folks, we're going to talk some Notre Dame recruiting here in four key commitments. And then everyone's, I think, when we talk about rankings, everyone absolutely adores Charles Power. Never says anything bad about him. They say, <laughs> Charles, you have such a great ranking of CJ Carr. Everyone loves him, right? Right, Charles? That, that's all I hear. Nothing but positive. Can we talk about how good looking this guy is right now? I mean, uh, he is uh, dreamy as ever. He's really good at watching kids, like football players, evaluating. And he's a good looking guy. I mean, I don't know. When How we talk about, better than that. When we talk about good looking men on the show, it's really just about Sam Hartman. So you you, you take it easy. Totally get it. Totally just, get it. I don't I don't blame everyone. I get it. All right. So we're gonna talk about four guys here. Uh first of them being uh Deuce Knight, Notre Dame's new quarterback commit. Um on three does rank him highest currently. Uh, number 28 overall player, number four quarterback. Now Rivals has him. You see the number one there. Rival still is in, you know, the late 90s or something. They still rank guys dual threat and pro style. Like, come on, all these guys need to move. But uh, and, uh, talk about that another day. So I'll go to you, Charles. And then, Cody, I want to hear your take on uh, Deuce Knight and this commitment for Notre Dame. Um, you know, we'll, we'll watch his uh, sophomore tape. Why don't you tell us what you see? Yeah, so, so Deuce Knight, and, and Cody has some numbers on this, but uh, he is – I think at this point has a very strong case as the most athletic quarterback in the 2025 cycle. Um, a guy who tested off the charts uh, in, in the camp circuit. And uh, I think has continued to kind of grow into his body and become more and more athletic. I mean, you can see that right there. I and mean, he's got a, a, a long stride in the open field. He can get to the edge uh, against defenses, kind of a, kind of an angle eliminator. And we saw, we saw that a little bit early on in his junior year when he was at Lipscomb and, um, I think you, you think about that game at Sarah Land, Sarah Land that was on nationally televised. You know, I think just the improvisational ability and being able to escape against pressure uh, just due to his athleticism is, is very high end. Um, so Cody and I have seen him in person uh, and I, I'm not sure Cody, how many times you've seen him. I know we saw him at OT seven and I saw him at Liscom Academy uh, his season opener against IMG. Mm -hmm. uh, he attended LSU camp too, saw him there as well. Okay, yeah. So we we've had we've had like at for this point in the cycle, I think a lot of in person exposure to Deuce. Um, I think right now I, I would kind of classify him as a very high upside kind of ball of clay physically. Um, he he he's a lefty. I think he's shown a, a pretty strong arm. I think the biggest thing for Deuce is he's just got to play and get experience. Uh, the 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 physical talent is is considerable. Um, and I think the times that we've seen him, like it hasn't always been necessarily a setting that is suited for his strengths. Like seven on seven is not something that he's, it's gonna, you're going to get the full deuce experience in, in seven on seven. Um, and seeing him against IMG, I mean, he was under duress every single play. Like, it's almost like you almost kind of come out of that game and, um, and, and I, it, like you had to kind of grade that like on a curve a little bit. And, and I came out of that game thinking, like, I mean, he's athletic. Like, they, he he could get out of some some tough situations with with his athleticism. So I think the biggest thing, like, kind of where I'm at, um, at at this stage, you know, is really I think how he finishes his junior year is going to be big for his development. I think the off season is going to be big for his development. Um, but but he's a guy who has a lot of upside, and I think he's interesting when you look at him in within Notre Notre Dame's quarterback room. Um, you know, he's a guy who is, is a little unique relative to his skill set. So uh, I think he kind of adds some some elements that they maybe don't have, or he's just a different type of quarterback that, than that, that would be in the room. Hey, hey, Cody, I know you were in here before. Um, you know, you're listed a few minutes before um, I yep. brought you on. What? The, so I'm curious for your take on on Deuce, and then my comment about kind of the the whole upside floor discussion with the back to back years of of yeah. Carr and Knight. Absolutely. Dude, I mean, to touch on your point, I thought you made earlier, I thought you were spot on. I mean, no, I, I mean, dead on when it comes to talking about taking high caliber quarterback prospects, especially in back to back years. 
a lot of teams, especially the ones that I've worked for in the past, they love to do the combination, right? Like you're saying, somebody like Deuce Knight, maybe a lower floor, higher upside guy. And the year prior, you take someone with a higher floor, you know, more of a low bust type of player, like a CJ Carr, where you feel like you know exactly what you're getting. That allows someone like a Deuce Knight or a high upside prospect, it gives them more time to figure it out. And, you know, that first year is a big learning curve for everybody, but especially with more developmental type prospects, it's a little nice to have somebody in your back pocket that you say, hey, we got CJ Carr a year before. He's more of a plug and play type of player. Let Deuce Knight figure it out. You know what I mean? That's I thought you were spot on with that. But when we talk about the player, right, Deuce Knight, first thing that comes to my mind is a beautiful piece of clay. Right. I mean, this is what the future and really the present of what quarterback play looks like in college football and the NFL. And this is what teams are coveting at the quarterback position. Right. Big athletic frames, arm talent and mobility. With Deuce, you get all three and at an extremely high level. I mean, look, the ball jumps out of his hand. I mean, he's got some serious zip on it. Nearly 200 pounds that can add close to 20 pounds at the next level. He's six foot four. And I cannot emphasize this enough, how freakishly athletic this kid is, right? We're talking 4 5 40, 40 inch vertical, 4 4 shuttle, 6 4 high jump, 23 4 long jump. As a junior in high school, those numbers are bonkers. And he's not even 17 years old. Mike, I played this game with Charles yesterday. Would you mind playing a game with me? Sounds great. See if you can name this QB based oh, off God. these numbers, okay? Okay. 6'4", 225, 4540, 35-inch vertical, and 4'4 four, four shuttle. Any guesses? Steve Angeli. Anthony Richardson coming out of high school. Okay? Very similar numbers. One more real fast, okay? 6'4", okay. right. 233 pounds, 4'5", 340, 32-inch vertical, and a 4'18 shuttle. Any guesses? Let's hear it. Colin Kaepernick. At the NFL Combine, that's the type of athletic ability that we're talking about at the QB position. Does he have a little bit of an elongated motion? Sure. Does he have some consistency issues with his accuracy? Sure. But he's a young developmental prospect with absurd upside. Any coach that wants to develop and actually coach quarterbacks wants someone like this kid. The, uh, the YouTube chat is triggering me right now because everyone is just like, well, when is on three going to drop them down low? And I'm like, God, it's like, uh, listen, I, I disagree. Cody, do I do I tell you guys I disagree with your rankings? All the time, All right? Time. <laughs> All the time. Charles, yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so with that in mind, I'm with you guys. But, like, you can't just be like, on three hates Notre Dame guys or their, their rankings are so – like, if their rankings are so bad, do you disagree with on three that – they have Deuce Knight ranked highest. They have Gerby Lambert ranked highest. Anthony Knapp ranked highest. Um, Kedra Young, Young ranked highest. Young. Bryce Young ranked way higher than everyone else. Like it's it's it evens out, guys. Just calm down, calm down. Um, but I mean, Kingston just got a bump like a hundred spots or something. And then is it still too low? Maybe, but. No, like just, just calm down a little bit. Charles, do you have any other uh, closing thoughts on Deuce before we move on? Not, not really. I mean, I, I just think like moving forward, the the biggest thing, um, the biggest thing is just going to be like the continued development. I think, I think it's huge for him to to get back on the field the, the, this this fall. Um, he's a guy who just needs live live in game reps, and it really, I mean, I would also add relative to the uh, ceiling floor conversation. I like, I think the way I kind of think about quarterbacks um, relative to, to ceiling and floor is probably a little different now than in the past. I, I think it's important to, um, to differentiate between like a passing ceiling and passing floor rather than like, okay, you can get on the field floor. Cause like guys who are that, this type of athlete, if you build your offense to fit his skill set, you can get on the field on a college football. Yeah. You can get out there, as a true freshman in certain situations, if you're that athletic. So some of that I think is the situation in the coaching staff, but I think the way that we have historically looked at ceiling and floor with quarterbacks um, probably needs to be adjusted a little bit when you're talking about guys who are like 
like superior athletes, super mobile, because I think that actually does raise your floor as a prospect. And I think as you go up levels, the ability to be mobile in the NFL gets you on the field earlier as well, because you're still learning game and in no like true freshman rookie NFL player is going to really know their offense that well. So the ability to bail yourself out of adverse situations with your athleticism actually raises your floor in my opinion. Yep. That's a great point. Yeah. For folks watching this, listen to me. If you talk to someone and they claim to be a football guy and they say that they love offensive line, like that's their number one position to watch and, and analyze. I know that's Tim Hyde and I know that's Charles power and I'm guessing Cody's nodding. So I'm guessing you too. So I'm just going to throw that out there because we're going to now talk about uh, Notre Dame's commitment on Tuesday. So Knight commits to Notre Dame on Monday, then a nice little tweet out from Gerby Lambert, uh, you know, around 8 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday. Uh, another guy that on three ranks uh, higher than the intro. I just got to throw that out there. OK, number 28 overall player, number four uh, offensive tackle in America, 6'6", 290 pounds. Cody, um, I will give you the floor on uh, this young man first. Yeah, man. I mean, to put it simply, he's a people mover, right? He's an enforcer in the run game. He does such a great job playing with leverage, bullying defenders out of their gaps. You know, he's only played two games so far this season, but he's just so strong at the point of attack and shows it not only on the football field, but he throws nearly 50 feet in the shot put, which is extremely impressive as a junior in high school. He's also so polished when it comes to using his length and his hands, which is just unbelievably rare to find with linemen coming out of high school. And he just seems so natural when it comes to hand fighting. You know, after talking to some of my guys in the personnel world, they, they believe that Gerby Lambert might be one of the safest offensive linemen in the entire country. And I want to emphasize that they chose the term offensive lineman and not necessarily offensive tackle. A guy like him with his movement skills, power, and his body density, there's no reason Gerby can't play significant snaps early on in his career as an interior offensive lineman, especially if he's one of your best five guys across the offensive front. To me, if you're a Notre Dame fan, you have to love this pickup, man. He's an absolute stud. Charles? Yeah, I, mean, I, I watched um, offensive tackle pretty closely for, for this update, and – like, like Cody mentioned, like Gerby, like the way they start in New England, the season starts later. So we just didn't have as many games to go through from him. But he was like a priority watch for me, like that first game, just to kind of see, you know, how he's moving, what he looks like physically. Uh, and I think he, I think he's moving great. Like I, we, we've had Gerby Lambert. I think, I think he was our number one offensive lineman in the initial on 300. So we've always been high yep. on him. It's actually very similar to um, Charles Jagasaw. Like it's, Kind of like he was like like there were two guys that we just really I think projected early and it, I think it's for similar reasons uh, natural movement skills I think Gerby is highly flexible like Cody mentioned he plays which I think with outstanding like pad level leverage gets underneath the defensive lineman and I think that creates like that ability to bend just creates like a just a, a great foundation for getting a push in the run game. Um, and, and I think he really works well at the second level. He's played actually a decent bit of football, like the last several years. I mean, he was like a starter on like a state championship team, I believe as like a sophomore. So, but, but I think you want to see the continual improvement. It's a very small sample size with him, but, uh, but I think it's really encouraging so far as a senior. And, and he's one, I think as we move through the fall, uh, like we're going to get a better grip on this offensive line group but he's one that i think like cody and i are bullish on relative to the group um j just based on uh kind of what he's put on film i think he's got like a guy who's showing continued improvement which is really what you want like i think especially with offensive linemen like guys that are like kind of like physically developmental positions you want guys that are going into college and they're they're ascending they're launching into college from a developmental standpoint you don't want somebody that's, that's going into college plateauing and i think he's gonna like continue to show like early signs of that um and i just like really like the move like the movement at second level i think he's a like a hellacious second level run blocker uh and a guy who plays right tackle so i think the biggest thing for him is going to be relative to like adjusting to the college level he's gonna be like working on his pass set like his pass set te technique but um, I think he has the physical ability, movement skills uh, to, to, to be good there. And that's a projection that we have to make with a lot of these 
high school offensive line. I mean, that, like, that is not something that's like singular to him. Like that's mm-hmm. you could really go down the list of all these guys, maybe with the exception of like a Jordan Seaton or like an Ellis Davis guys that are like really polished at the high school level, um, like in, in pass pro. But it, that that's relatively rare. And you can like, a lot of that's just like a skill set base. You can pick that up with college coaching. And, and Notre Dame has like a really good track record of like developing guys in that area. Yeah. yeah. And when, just sorry, please. just to piggyback off your point, Charles. I mean. When you talk about these guys' development from sophomore to junior to senior, you see a lot of these guys that have the movement skills and the ability to move around in space and all that. But there's a part of it, too. And I don't know if I can say this, Mike. I mean, the kid's an ass kicker, right? I mean, like, that's what he likes to do. He's a violent player. And with some of these guys, they have the movement skills and they have the traits and the athletic ability, but they're not violent at the point of attack. With Gerby, that's not an issue. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's uh, Gerby Lamberts. When a lot of people talk to me about Mike, Notre Dame needs to sign more five-star players. I'm like, I mean, Gerby might end up being a five-star. Notre Dame signed Emil Wagner and Charles Jagasaw on three five-stars, maybe not elsewhere, um, but uh, at least on three five-stars. Now, speaking about a player who uh, a lot of people want to see as a five-star, and that's C.J. Carr. I think Charles Power has become popular in the Notre Dame fan base just because of his outlier ranking here number 192 overall player number 14 quarterback charles i'm sure every time you uh, go on twitter someone's yelling at you for for this ranking so talk to people about this ranking why is it why do you hate notre dame all of those things charles i'll i'll, I'll give you the floor as we watch his uh, junior tape yeah i i think uh you know how we how we stack these quarterbacks it's all of our rankings are, are started by the position. So it's, we, we stack the position first and then we kind of tear it out into the, into the bigger list. So I think if you're looking at a court, like a prospect like CJ Carr, start off with, with, with where he stacks in, in the position, if you kind of want like context and kind of what we're thinking um, in, in, in putting it together. Uh, you know, he's been, he's been a guy on the radar for a long time. I shoot, like, I'm like, I told you this last time, I think I've watched more CJ Carr than, I mean, it's, it's up there like with, with the, guys that I've watched the most over the last probably three seasons. I, I think I would say the vast majority of his snaps the last three years we, we we've watched. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think his, his strengths, he's a guy who's like very polished. He's um, I think he strives within it, like just excels within structure. When you saw him at the elite 11, I mean, like if you put him in like a, a camp setting with drills, like this is like really easy for him. Um, he's just natural in, in that regard. I think it's good that he's played a lot of football. I think early on in his senior season, kind of one thing I wanted to see from him was just the game slowing down. I felt like there were some times as a junior where it could speed up for him a little bit. And some of that's just like experience. It's just like a, like I always say, like for quarterbacks to performance craft and, and there's certain things that you can't really replicate outside of a live, a live setting. Um, and you know, I, I think, I think he's shown, some encouraging signs uh, as a senior. He's completing like 70% of his passes. His yards per attempt is up. Um, you know, I think there's with, – with CJ, it's a little bit of a different sample size um, given that uh, – or, or just may, maybe different relative to some others. Like they've had a couple blowout wins. Um, and, and, you know, the offense he's in, it's a lot of side to side. It's a lot of short passing. Uh, so I would love to see him like – in a back and forth game where he's having to push the ball downfield kind of under duress. Um, but I, I think so far, like I think there's some signs of some, you know, maybe not like anything glaring, but I think there's some signs of like, you know, just positive like development and, 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 and improvement. So um, that's something we're going to be watching closely. Like I'm, I think they're liable to make a pretty deep run. Like I think they're ranked pretty highly in the state and I would love to just see some more, some more games, but uh, and I think he's like making some plays with his legs as well. Like I was, I went through and kind of just did like an accounting of, of the quarterbacks and polishing up on their stats today. And uh, I think you have to be encouraged with, with kind of what he's doing on, on the ground, particularly like in the red zone as well. <clears throat> Bump them up or I'm going to burn your house down. <laughs> Sorry. I had to I get something out of my chest there. Cody, can I get two minutes from, from you on, on CJ Carr? Yeah, man. I mean, Charles touched on it, right? The senior season so far, he's had a solid start in the limited sample size, right? Nothing crazy one way or the other, but steady Eddie and he's winning games. From a film perspective, what I feel like we've seen is someone who's completing a ton of underneath and intermediate passes, whose receivers really are gathering most of the yardage. 
Uh, a lot of quick game like slant, swing routes, hitches, screens. We, and we've also seen some hesitation with pulling the trigger, which can be extremely costly at the next level, right? Especially since the speed of the game is so much quicker. However, I will say, man, he's shown some more creativity in his game, especially in being able to adjust a bit more on the fly. He looks like he's gotten more comfortable when things break down and maneuvering outside the pocket. But I want to see if he can do it consistently, especially over an entire season, as opposed to a limited four game stretch. Plus, a lot of these early games have been blowouts. Right. So I want to see him face some more adversity and see how he handles some pressure and things like that. But at the end of the day, he's someone we really think has tremendous arm talent. He's a terrific passer when everything's within structure and on time. He's shown some flashes of the athleticism and mobility that we wanted to see this year. And it looks like he's becoming more creative from outside the pocket. And I honestly believe like, and I think Charles thinks that like, we really do look forward to seeing if he can maintain that over the course of a season. Yeah. Just real quick, Charles, like you think the setting of the all-star game will be pretty important for, for CJ and your guys evaluation for him. I mean, sure. I, I think, you know, from my experience, the the All Star Game is something where I think I think it depends on its prospect to prospect. Like when we saw Dante Moore at the All American Bowl last year, it was so obvious he was the top yeah. guy there, and he was a guy we had to move up. Um, you know, I remember seeing Jameis Winston at Under Armour one year, and he could not throw a spiral in in the cold weather, and he went in the in the dome and threw like five touchdowns in the game. So like, there's like th there's certain uh, pieces of the evaluation that I think it might matter more per prospect for CJ. I think I would want to see how his senior season goes first before I would say like, Oh, the all-star game is going to be like make or break for him. Yeah. Um, but, but uh, I, I, I think generally see, like, I think you can see guys under pressure in, in, in that, like in, in the practice setting, um, just seeing how they, how they respond to pressure. That's probably what the all-star game to me, uh, best like signifies in the evaluation, and then also too, it's like it's like pretty tight passing windows. Like you're you're throwing against top corners out there, and and yep. um, I think that's a setting where you really can you can just like the the level of play, the athleticism on the field is like ratcheted up. You, you're going to have receivers that can run 50 yards downfield, and you you can hit them in stride and not worry about like overthrowing them. So okay. uh, it's just kind of a little elevated thing, but I wouldn't say it's it would be make or break for sure, but it would be something I would want to see how a senior season goes first. Got it. Uh, I got you guys for about five more minutes where we have to move on, but wanted to sneak in talking about Kingston Villiamu. So just another headliner in Notre Dame's class. Um, he, he, he was, I put out, a, we put out a graphic on three and it was like not ranked to two Oh one for national rankings. Everyone was like, Oh my God, on three to have them ranked. No, it was not ranked in the on 300, which then people right. are like, well, that's even worse, but uh, neither here nor there. Um, so number 201 overall player in the country, you guys can bump them up, I think, 15 spots in the linebacker rankings. So um, that number 12 spot, again, I the national rankings are what people look at first, but that's comparing linebackers to guards and quarterbacks. And it, I, I know it's never going to happen. I wish the national rankings just went away, but they're just too darn big of a talking point for, for all the fans. So it's never going to happen. But 12 is pretty close to 9 and 10, but, I, you know, it's just the national ranking that's so much different. And as Charles explained earlier, like, if he just moves up, like, two spots in the linebacker rankings, it's probably, like, 100 spots up in national rankings, right? But anyways, uh, we'll go to Cody first. Um, and again, just got a, a few minutes, but um, pop on uh, his junior tape. What do you see for from Kingston Villiamu also, Cody? Yeah, man. I mean, Kingston was somebody that we we're really looking forward to seeing early on in his senior season, right? Um, going into the year, we had questions, right, regarding the top end speed, overall movement skills in space. Between the tackles, not an issue, right? Continues to be a monster. He's excellent when it comes to pulling the trigger and exploding on contact. His ability to diagnose and bring ball carriers to the ground is extremely impressive. In this season, he's continued to play at that same level between the hashes. But honestly, and this is why he deserved the bump, he's shown some improvement when it comes to making plays in the open field and as a space defender, right? He's being asked to do so much more in the open field. That includes being asked to cover backs out of the backfield, drop into deeper zones, play man in the slot, cover to the flat. I mean, all in all, he's simply being asked to make more plays in space. And he's definitely put that on film. And he's gaining confidence in those areas, even in this limited sample size, right? 
Kingston's definitely somebody that's trending in the right direction, which is why he was significantly bumped. Uh, but we still want to see him in a setting where we can see him move around in person, especially comparatively to some of these other top backers in the country. It, to me, it reminded me of a situation with a guy like Whit Weeks last year who signed with LSU last cycle, who we had some extremely similar concerns. We were able to see him in person at the All-American Bowl and determine that he could, in fact, run with some of the best athletes in the country. And I could see Kingston finding himself in a very similar scenario. Charles? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Cody hit on it. Uh, it just like we, I think when you look at his skill set, he is like he excels between the tackles. I think he sees the play like he triggers really quickly. He sees things quickly, instinctually. I think he's there. Um, I yeah, like I and I agree from, with what Cody said. Like, he's making plays. In, he's making more plays in space. And I think when you watch St. John Bosco play, like he's like the alpha on the defense. Like he's the guy. He's kind of the fulcrum for everything they do on defense this year, uh, which he, you know, in the past, he might've been more of a role player. Uh, but I think also like, I think it's important to see him in a neutral setting outside of the St. John Bosco defense. Um, just because like evaluating these, these schools that are these powerhouse schools where you have prospects that play really defined roles. I think it's really important to see them in a neutral setting where they're, where they're outside of kind of the, 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 the situation that they're in in high school, which which I think relative to a lot of other prospects, like your your average prospect is, is not playing at a, at a school like this where where they're just so well coached and really put in great positions. Um, so I think seeing him in the neutral setting is really going to help us determine his upside. Like we know, like I think Kings, Kingston Villamuas is going to be a very good college player. He's pro- I, I think he's liable to get on the field early. But but we were gonna. I think seeing him relative to like side by side with all these guys going through drills, running sideline to sideline, covering tight ends and running backs out of the backfield. That's where we're really gonna. I think get a good indication of of where he's at from an upside perspective, and that'll help us kind of determine his ceiling because he's not a guy that we like seen in person. Um, it's all been within kind of that like St. John Bosco context. Um, yeah. So I think you feel good about like his ability just from a linebacker skill perspective. Um, but I think it's going to be really like informative for us to like size him up alongside like other top linebackers. Yep. And, and to your point, Charles, I mean, it, it's not that we don't think he can, it's that we just don't know if he can. I think that's a really important distinction. And that's what I think that live setting will allow us to answer those questions. We don't think he can't. It's just a matter of, can he, and if and, we get that answered in a live setting, that's great. And I think I think when you look at li- the linebacker position as well, like when you look at uh, it, it, it's a position where position specific skill is probably less valued now when you're yes. scouting the position, totally relative to like a receipt like receiver. Um, you know, I think when you look at linebacker, it's a position where you see guys from all different like area like positions and like. You'll see quarterbacks playing linebacker. You'll see guys mm-hmm. who are running high school running backs. So our like our starting point or, or kind of a important criteria for that is it's like size, speed, length, athleticism. And obviously, like I think you look for like the football character, toughness piece a, a, as well, phys- physicality. Um, but but it's a position where you can get up to speed relatively quickly at the college level um, if you're like that good of an athlete. So um, that's just like I, that, that. That's just like kind of a factor I think that that we look for at linebacker because that's how you know colleges look at it. That's how the NFL definitely looks at it, um, and it's kind of trended into more like an athlete position. So I think it's important context when you're like looking at our linebacker rankings. Like our, like the, our top linebackers are all like pretty freakish athletes. All right, Cody. Belair and Charles Power on three uh, rankings and scouting guys. I appreciate you guys uh, talking some Notre Dame recruiting with us. Um, and uh, I'm sure I'll catch you guys soon. Sounds good, man. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Right. That is uh, Cody Belair and Charles Power do a fantastic job. Even, uh, you know, you guys might disagree with some of their rankings, and I do as well. You guys are just – if you were watching me at all during that and you see me laughing, it's because I'm reading chat. I'm like, damn, you guys are ruthless. Like, everyone's just like, these guys are dumb. And I'm like, I mean, they're, they're talking ball. Like, I I, I don't know. I, maybe I'm just uh, too uh, 
too level headed. Maybe I just need to to get with the the program and just yell at these guys. I don't know. Tim, what what you uh what do you think? I know you were listening. Oh no, it was a nice you know nice conversation. I mean, I always I just like listening to guys talk football. So I mean, you're gonna people disagree and all the hate. I mean, yeah, some of the comments are like, my God, <laughs> it's like they're just they're just doing rankings as is every other single service that does rankings. So I don't know, Mike, you just keep bringing up guys that where Notre Dame's ranked higher than everyone and people just don't like that because they're just stuck on one guy. It, well, I, 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 I've, said it, I've said it for a year. No matter what gets said, it's all about C.J. Carr. It's it's stuck on one guy, and, and that's, it, that's it. That's all it's all we care about. And if they had Carr and in, Kingston yeah. ranked the highest, but everyone else low is no one gives a damn. No one gives a damn. Um, but – it's uh, right. that, that's just how right. it goes. you know, and it's, it's a ranking. It's like they still got to go to Notre Dame and play. It doesn't, you know, just because I don't know, man, it, it's rankings. I don't get so hung up on them. They're cool to look at, see who's who. Data know. point, Tim. It's a data point. It's fun to look back in 10 years, 20 years from now and see who did what at Notre Dame. You go to the blue and gold yearbooks and go from there. It's like it, it's all a data point. It's if CJ Carr is ranked 35th by power. And he goes to Notre Dame and he flops. Everyone would rip him, right? It, it's no. Just, oh, on. well, well, the thing is, if Carr goes to Notre Dame and flops, no one's going to be like, oh, good, good for you, Charles. No, no, no one cares, but he's, he's not going to. But anyway, it's recruiting, you know what? I've always, I mean, I, I mean, I've followed recruiting forever. I think it's fun. It's interesting to see what's what. I've coached guys that are ranked. I've coached guys that are nationally ranked. I've had all Americans and things of that nature. So it's always interesting how some of that goes and whatnot, but the guys I've coached that have been ranked that they don't sit there and hit refresh seeing what their rankings are. They, they, I've never coached a guy that's been, uh, you know, obsessed with it and things of that nature because they still got to play football and everyone that I've signed and played division one football is like, doesn't mean a damn thing if I go to so-and-so school. So it's all good. It, it's fun. It's a good thing. It's fun for fans to see, uh, it, you know, and you could say it matters to a point, right? But it's a point of where you're constantly packing guys on top of each other, which Georgia, Bama, Ohio State has done. Notre Dame is doing that now over the last three cycles and building now and for 2025. So yeah. it's all getting there. You just keep getting guys. You got Knight, Carr, you got all the you know quarterbacks. The running back room is is turning into a you know just freaks on top of freaks linemen all coming in and then it all works itself out and that's when you have a ass kicking football program is when you got a lot of dudes yeah d rock says uh services need to be consistent on how they rank these guys all over the board um no no they no, don't, they don't. That, that they I, no they sh what do you want them to get all together and be like what are we going to rank these guys no they, it's differing opinions it'd be awful if they all ranked the same they then they shouldn't um but I I agree on that, Mike. Why do you want to have all the same guys be parrot heads doing the same thing? What the heck yeah. is that for? Okay. Uh, a couple super chats. Tim says, Goolsby is the man, and Tim's here. Talk ball, guys. Go Irish BOSU. So like I said at the top of the show, we're talking yeah. recruiting. Uh, we have a really cool guest coming on, um, and uh, he may have just committed to Notre Dame a couple days ago. Um, so we'll, we'll get him in here shortly. Um, and uh, But first, we are going to um, hear from one of our sponsors um, and, uh, folks, this is definitely, a, a, one of our most unique sponsors. Um, so maybe you're looking for a perfect gift for the Notre Dame fan in your life. Maybe even yourself will look no further than the beautiful artwork of Barb Stevens. She, she lives near campus, um, and has always been inspired to create pen and inks of the iconic buildings throughout the campus. In fact, she has even been commissioned by the university of of Notre Dame. Let me remove that real quick. Um, she's been uh, commissioned by the University of Notre Dame uh, many times to create artworks of those classic buildings to give um, as special gifts. And now she has a selection of four Notre Dame limited edition pen and ink prints she is offering to our listeners here at Blue and Gold. What makes each pen and ink print so unique and one of a kind is the hand-painted metallic gold she applies to each one. They really are simply stunning. To purchase and view Barb's art, visit her website, barbstevenson.com. Uh, that's barbstevenson.com, B-A-R-B-S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S-O-N.com. Or you can call Barb at 574-210-8388. 
8. Order now and receive free shipping anywhere in the continental United States. Order today at barbstevenson.com. Okay. Um, Tim, here's a here's a good one for you. Who had Sam. better hair, Brady Quinn back in the day or Sam Goatman? <laughs> Man, I thought it was going to be uh, – God, that's a great – that's a great one. Uh, Man, it, Sam Hartman's got some good good hair, you know. As I always say, my dad did like two things in this world for me, and one of them's great hair. So yeah. Sam, Sam's got good hair. I will say that he's he, he's got some he's got some great hair. So I'll, I'll go with Sam Hartman since he's the yeah since he's up and running. Let's do that. Let's go right. Sam Hartman. And, there you um, go. Tim, that's 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 great work right there for me. Just putting you on the spot with something as clearly just doing mm-hmm. some. Uh, are you, filler time. No, no, so, I do. Are you, are you ready for the next guest? Because I had oh, another 30 second filler if you need it. So. Oh, no, I'm ready for the next guest because he's here in the green room, fired up, absolutely fired up to bring on uh, Notre Dame quarterback commit. Yes, Notre Dame quarterback commit Deuce Knights in the 2025 class. Uh, nation's number 39 overall player, number three quarterback for the industry ranking, but I'm sure Deuce is coming for that number one spot. Deuce, how are you doing tonight, man? Sorry. I'm doing good. So, <laughs> We're going to talk to you with my uh, co-host, Tim Hyde, here, folks. Again, this is Deuce Knight. Really fi- I'm, I'm definitely fired up to have him in tonight's show. I so appreciate it. you announced that commitment Monday. And, and, Deuce, I know when a lot of kids commit, you know this too, they'll post, hey, my commitment date's in three weeks from now. Here it is. Deuce Knight tweets it out right before Mark Simmons' press conference Monday. So you catch everyone by surprise, right? Sure, a lot of you know, you know friends at school, obviously all the fans on Twitter. So like, how's the week been after giving that surprise commitment to everybody? Uh, it's been crazy, you know. Like uh, Notre Dame, the fans they show a lot of love, so it's been crazy. Like my phone been blowing up, just random text messages, like on Twitter, Instagram, uh, just everybody kind of telling me congratulations and things like that. So, but it's been a good week. All right, I want to talk about the fit in the offense. Um, I mean, you bring a different skill set than maybe Notre Dame has had with your, you know, four or five speed and your ability to push the ball downfield. Um, so in your conversations with that Notre Dame staff, what have they told you about how they plan to utilize you? And I'm guessing that was a pretty big part in you picking Notre Dame. Oh, uh, yes, sir, for sure. So, uh, like obviously, like you said, I I bring a different skill set uh to the room than what everybody else has. So like Coach Parker and Coach Gadu, they told me that uh. They just we we plan. Coach Parker just said we're gonna tailor like everything to what what I what uh, fits me. Uh, everything that I do best, like we're gonna have a lot of RPO game. Uh, we're gonna get outside the pocket and throw the ball. A lot of play action, deep shots, type things like that. Yeah. Um, now Notre Dame, I know when they're recruiting prospects, they'll talk about you know choosing hard. Like for yeah. you, dude, I'm sure it would have been a lot easier to just. Go to Ole Miss, stay in state. It's easier for your family to get there. You know, maybe go across state lines and go to Auburn. Still an easy drive, but you pick Notre Dame. You're choosing hard, right? Is that something that the Notre Dame staff talked to you about? And kind of tell me about why you chose hard and pick Notre Dame. Oh uh, yes, I you know Coach Freeman. I heard Coach Freeman say that plenty of times, but uh, I, I feel like uh, going to Notre Dame. I wouldn't say it's choosing hard, but it kind of is though, because you know. It's like 12 hours from my crib. I'm in SEC country, so uh, everybody, I'm pretty sure they thought I was going to go to Ole Miss, go to Auburn, Tennessee, like you said. But, uh, yeah, I, I chose I chose to go to Notre Dame. First off, it's just like the love that that, that they show, like Coach Freeman, Coach Parker, Chad, uh, Coach Gadulin, like they show a different type of love. Like I said, I can uh, call those guys any time of the day for like anything, and they'll pick up. Uh, second is just I can compete for a national championship uh, every year and then like get they hold academics to a high standard so that's something that's very important for me then like the relationships and networking that like you get from going Notre Dame like I feel like you have a higher chance of being successful after football like come going to Notre Dame so Tim uh, yes yes Uh, first off Deuce I mean the chat, everyone's hyped for you. Lots of great comments for you. Everyone's excited. Welcome to the family, all that good stuff. So I, my 
my question, I was talking to M Mike Singer earlier today about something and what I was very interested in. You mentioned the love you've had since you've committed. I would like to know what it was like when on Pot of Gold Day. What was that experience like? Because that's a huge event that Marcus Freeman has really uh, pushed for the last three years is the Pot of Gold Day, talking recruiting 18 months away. But what was that like, that build up to Pot of Gold, if you knew about it? Or, and you know, and, and you know, more so that day and how Notre Dame fans have been, you know, following you ever since then. Oh, uh, yes, sir. So the build up to that day, I think uh, Chad, he kind of hit my coach up probably a month before part of Gold Day, uh, a little over a month before part of Gold Day. And like ever since then, like uh, when they hired Coach Parker, the OC, and before he was uh, even hired as the OC, he was still the tight ends coach. So uh they they just made sure they stayed in contact with me i talked to coach freeman probably the next day after chad first hit my head coach up and whenever they hired coach Caduli, we he made sure I, we got on the phone and got to talk so uh so i knew it was coming they told me oh uh, it was coming we just had to wait to part of gold day and then like ever since then uh, our fans we got the best fans in the nation so like they always show a lot of love on any post like even if I post another school there, like be in the comments, like go Iris, dropping the clovers and all that. So, Deuce, I want to talk to you about Gino Gadouli because he's Notre Dame's new quarterbacks coach. Of course, they had Tommy Reese, who's now at Alabama, who I'm sure you've got to know uh, when you when you visited there. But um, talk to us about Gino Gadouli because I read your quote that you gave Hayes Fawcett and you gave love to Chad. Um, and Coach Freeman and Coach Parker, of course. But you did say, like, Gino Gadulli was the guy you were tightest with. So can you just tell me about the relationship with him and how important that was for you? Uh, yes, sir. So me coming to Notre Dame, I felt like Coach Gino, like, played a huge role in that. Uh, you know, me and Coach Gino tight. We talked probably every day of the week. He going to send me a text. We going to get on the phone, get on FaceTime, chop it up, talk ball, talk about life, all those things. So we had a great relationship. He I feel like he's a kind of guy like like me, uh, like really chill, just like, and we just know how to handle business and things like that. But then we still like to play around and have fun and things like that. And then I feel like Coach Gino, uh, he did just did a great job of uh, recruiting my uh, parents too. Like him, my dad, they probably talk more than me. So I feel like like that's a good thing. Now, one other thing I wanted to mention real quick, and I interviewed your head coach, James Ray, back in March, like the day or, or the day after you got that offer. And this is, quote, what he said. He's the total package, character academics. He has the chance to be our valedictorian. Now, that was back in March. I don't know if you're still tracking on that path. But still, if you were ever had a chance to be a valedictorian, you know, that, that means you're pretty darn smart. And then he also said, in my 10 years of covering uh, – Called or, or 10 years in college football recruiting, I can't recall a scenario of a Division One recruit also being in the conversation of a possible valedictorian. I've been coaching, uh, he said, I, I've been coaching for 31 years, never heard of it. Um, so I think I messed up the first part of that quote. I'll have to fix that in my <laughs> yeah. article. But So he's been coaching for 31 years, so he said he's never heard of that. Uh, Deuce, academics pretty good for you, man. Tell me about like favorite, uh, you know, things in school, you know, favorite subjects and stuff like that. Uh, so... Academics, yeah, they. I'm I'm very big on academics. That's that's a big reason why I chose uh, Notre Dame. But if we're being honest, I've never been the person to really like school. It's just something you have to do. Like it's like practicing. So if I'm gonna go out there, if I'm gonna go to school every day, I'm still gonna try to be the best at like whatever I'm doing at school. So I'm not gonna slack off just because I don't like it. Uh, but I say like. History probably my favorite subject. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a big math type guy or a big English type guy because I just don't like all the writing you have to do with all the English. So I say history. Tim, did you have anything else for Deuce? Yeah, just real quick, uh, Deuce. You know the the chat's calling you the, the left-handed Vince Young, which is a pretty awesome uh, compliment. So. You know, who do you like to watch on either Saturdays in college football or on the S on YouTube and things like that? Who are you out there studying these days? Uh, my favorite quarterback is Cam Newton, hands down. I watch his highlight tape at, at Auburn probably a thousand times. 
Uh, but right now in the NFL, I like watching uh, Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, you know, things they do, all the crazy arm angles, uh, athletic too. And then in college, I like watching Michael Penix, and that's my guy, uh, Kevin Williams, same. All right, we're going to go rapid fire. Are you ready for this, Deuce? I got you. Let's go. Notre Dame fans know that I'm a big Taco Bell guy. So when you go to Taco Bell, what's your go-to order? Uh, chicken quesadillas, you know. I one, one time I had that for like five days straight. Me too, my brother. Me too. <laughs> Love me some chicken quesadillas. Yeah. All right, uh, favorite video game of all time? Uh, it got to be Madden. That's all I really play, Madden. Madden? Who's your favorite yes, team? Sir. Oh, uh, the Panthers. Panthers, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Cam Newton, of course. Yeah. Uh, favorite part about Notre Dame's campus? Part. Oh, uh, it got to be probably the Golden Dome. I love the Golden Dome. That's, it's, it look good to me. Love those pictures of you with the Golden Dome in the background. Oh, uh, yeah. Pretty nice. Pretty nice. Uh, yes, sir. Funniest Notre Dame coach? Uh, well, Chad. It got to be Chad, even though he's like head recruiter. But Chad, he just – Chad is a real character. I was expecting that um, to be your answer, and I'm going to ask about Chad uh, after this. But is there a Notre Dame commit that you'd say you're maybe the tightest with right now or that you talk the most with? Uh, no, so I really hadn't talked to uh, many of the Notre Dame commits. I know uh, my first time up there, I chatted, chatted with Carson Hobbs a bit. So You're going to meet a lot of them. Yeah, I already know. I, I see. Yeah, you're going to meet a lot of them Saturday. One word to describe Chad Bowden. Uh, energetic. Got energetic. the most energy. Most energy in the building. And then one word to describe your game as a quarterback. And then, you know, you can expand on it. I'm just going to say competitor. I think, like, just me. I, I hate losing. So you just going to get, like, everything out of me. Like, I, I'm hurting all. I'm still going to try to give everything. So competitor. Okay. All right. We do have one other. So in, in this show, Deuce, you know, I've told you, like, we have a bunch of different people coming on. So the guy who's joining us next, his name is Mike Goolsby. Uh, he was a captain and linebacker at Notre Dame. So, Mike, I just know you want to say something to Deuce real quick. Yeah, Deuce. Welcome to the family, brother. Uh, and thank you. And thank you for choosing the Irish. I can't tell you how – you already know how excited the fan base is. You know, player alumni like myself, we're over here freaking out. So yes, uh, thank you. And we do, you and I already have something in common. I was never a fan of school myself. I was a history major in college. I didn't mess with math either. So, uh, but like Coach Freeman's touched on, choose hard. Uh, yes, sir. And I can promise you, I just turned 41 a few, few days ago, and I wouldn't be where I am without the school. So uh, proud of you. And just, again, thank you from all of us as ex-players. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, Deuce, appreciate you joining tonight's show, man. I'll talk yes, to you again sir. soon. Thank you. Yes, Take sir. Care, Deuce. Oh, my gosh. I had chills hearing Mike talk to Deuce Knight. Oh. That was so cool. Goosby got me hyped, man. I was like, man, I, I almost cried a little bit. Love I'm it. nervous. I'm nervous, man. What a stud. What a stud. It was awesome. I'm, oh, man. Not even 17. Uh, just going back to the interview you had with Charles and, and uh, Cody, I was like taking some notes here, and I'm like, not even 17 yet. And this guy's like getting bombarded. You know, just the, the pressure and the Notre Dame fans, but he's loving it and still doing his thing. And man, it's 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 a different day than when uh, Mike Goolsby was, you know, the, the cat's meow back then and whatnot. It's crazy how recruiting has become, Mike. Yeah, so. building off that, Tim, a couple takeaways. It's pretty evident, at least with Deuce's recruitment, like, you know, the Irish fans showing him love on Twitter, that matters. Yes. So for any Irish fan watching, um, take note. And then, yeah, I was going to ask him a question, but you know, he did, he did a great job, but, uh, I think you asked him at the end, Mike, something about how would he describe his game? Perfect answer. Perfect answer. Perfect answer. I'm a competitor. Perfect answer. Didn't tell him I was going to ask him that. Mm -hmm. Perfect answer. Perfect answer. The only answer. What? I got, I, I'm getting chills. Well, I mean, I mean, it, well, it goes back to Cam Newton. So no matter what you think of Cam Newton, that dude could play ball. And the fact that he just studies Cam, and um, which is pretty cool. I, that was interesting. I'm, I was, you know, I'm always curious in what kids are watching. And here's a guy, uh, he watches Cam Auburn. That's 2010. 
So that's a long time ago. And the fact that he's just sitting there studying his game, that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. When you, when you're like Vince Young, I'm thinking to myself, man, that was 2005. I'm like, he's yeah. not born yet, but, uh, um, uh, I love it. It's yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 a drunk yeah. Vigo or a guy who's here every single week is, He's hammering that home. The the le- I saw that le- I actually wrote it down, Vigo, for you. The left-handed Vince Young. I yeah. like that. That's awesome. Regarding Goolsby's note about like the 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 people see the stuff on Twitter, it can also be negative. So like Kev says here, keep it to yourself. It's not a positive thing. I will see Notre Dame fans. You guys will tweet things and and it's tagged. The kids tag on it. I'm like, why are you doing that? You, you, it, it, so it can be a negative thing, but I think the kids are smart enough to know that. That's just, that's just, that's just a small majority, and it, it's all fan bases. All fan bases have that. But uh, uh, Tim, uh, you want to talk to Goolsby about the excitement for the game? What do you? What do well, you he's about? going. I can't. I mean, I'm I'm hyped for him. It's is Mike Goolsby going to bring you know Notre Dame two iconic top well Ohio State six, which stinks, but. Two big wins in a row. He was at Clemson last year, and he got Ohio State this year. So, man, let's let's take thirty seconds, right? Or we'll take three hours, and let's just jump into it, man. I, I mean, you, I mean, when I think of Mike Goolsby, I'm always thinking that I always think of Michigan, obviously Tennessee. So, meaning you've been in big top ten games. What, what's that stadium going to be like Saturday night, Mike? I tell you, that Tennessee game. Yes. It's worth mentioning. So like our, our schedules are made years in advance. And when yep. I committed to Notre Dame, I was going to be a 17 year old freshman. I have a September birthday. So I enrolled as a 17 year old and I assumed that I would redshirt. It didn't work out that way just because I was young. And, you know, you look five years down the road, you're like, damn, we're playing at Tennessee. You know, there's 110,000 people. And Tim, I had that game scheduled five years in advance while I'm still in high school. Love it. And I think, you know, when you talk about this environment, I hope that like your better players take the same approach, yeah. you know, and then you've got this new coaching staff and you're under Freeman's regime. And Coach Kelly did a lot of great things for the program, but it never seemed to me like that he admitted that we're playing Clemson, we're playing USC. This is a big freaking deal. He always seemed to take the it's, a, you know, whether we're playing Central Michigan or whether we're playing USC, we're going to have the same approach. To hell with that, Tim. To hell right. with that. So I think it's okay for our players, you know, to, to have this build up. And this is why you come to a Notre Dame. I mean, this is a night game. Night games at Notre Dame Stadium are incredibly special. I think the weather's going to be beautiful all, all day. Nice. And um, just truly, at, you know, I always – look at things through the player's perspective, like embrace this. And this is a big deal to a lot of people. I mean, Tim Hyde's been, you've devoted a year of your life to this, Tim. You know, it's a big deal. And uh, go play like it. Well, 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 let's bounce off of that real quick, Mike. I mean, when, I mean, I've been hyped for a year, most definitely, because when you hear Ohio State, I mean, you're from the Chicago Catholic Leagues. So when you hear Ohio State, you played at Notre Dame. Notre Dame's SC Michigan, we get it. And you don't get Ohio State unless it's something you know, like just saying schedule 20 years in advance or a bowl game. I, I've, I've been to the two Fiesta Bowls. Not fun leaving after they lost to Ohio State. Those Buckeye fans are not cool at all. You wear an Irish shirt, man. They're brutal. So I've been to those two things, driving home from you know Phoenix to Los Angeles. Not cool. But uh, it's like when you hear Ohio State, what do you, I mean, what does Mike Goolsby think? What is – you know, the Notre Dame guys of yesteryear who didn't get to play in this game, think about it. Gosh. I know. <laughs> so it's like, you know, if you're going to lump, this is the fun part, Deuce, if you're still watching. Like, this is the, a fun part of playing at Notre Dame. We got a ton of rivals. You got a ton of rivals. Um, schools you wouldn't even think of, like a Purdue is a rival. You know, yeah. a Michigan State, hate Michigan State. Some of this is the way they play the game, Tim, right? Yeah. You know, as a fan, sometimes you're so is- – or excuse me, as a player, you're isolated from the fan base. So coming out of it, I know <laughs> – I'm just – I'm biting my tongue so hard, gentlemen. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, Ohio State fans are a piece of work. Put it that way. Yeah. Uh, like a USC – I t- always tended to respect USC until Lendell White spit in my face. I no longer respect USC. That happened. 
Um, but they've got the athletes, they've got the tradition, a Michigan, kind of the same thing. You know, you respect them. I don't feel as an ex player, ex captain, I don't feel any respect for Ohio state. I just don't. Um, I don't, you know, the, the program, I mean, it's, it's had a checkered recent past Tim, which is something that I don't think those, their fans ever touch on. I don't think it's something that they should be proud of. Um, you know, you juxtapose that with how Notre Dame handles their business. Our guys go to class. I don't think it's the case right. at Ohio State. I mean, hate is a very strong word, Tim. Um, and I go back to, you know, we had Tom Zibikowski on the show. And Tom Tom and I, Zibby and I, when we were in school, we were very, very close. We take eyes baths every day, you know, separate, Mike, you weirdo, um, <laughs> after practice. And I remember, I can remember that bowl game, um, where Zibby played Ohio State and just like rooting for him. And you know, I just, I kind of have that same sentiment. There's no respect there. Dislike the program, dislike the way they operate as compared um, to a Notre Dame. No, that's, that's a good point. And what kills me is, is, you know, here, here's a reason why, you know, one of my big things with the Buckeyes is, man, they, their last two national titles, those, I don't care what they say. They've been, they've been lucky as hell. How's that? Hmm. Get a PI that beat Miami that gave them that game. And then obviously them getting over, you know, with Baylor and TCU, how they got placed into that one. That drives me nuts to this day. So I'm like, I don't want the Buckeyes to win a damn thing. And they got two national titles. I feel like, like, you know, they were like gifted some of those things, gifted those opportunities a bit. And it drives me nuts. But you're right about the class. I've had a couple guys that I've coached get offers, Mike. You've been on recruiting visits. I've had a couple of guys go to Columbus, Ohio, and it's just like this is how we do things academically, kind of like what you're just kind of in fear, you know, saying a little bit. It is a little bit different there. That's why Michigan and those guys don't like each other forever. Ohio State is is just different. They don't. It, it just is. They don't. I mean, especially. I mean, who's the quarterback that talked about he never went to class? Was that was that Fields? That was Justin Fields, right? It was just, I never went to class. I just took online stuff, handed in papers. And it just and it's just nobody grabs okay. nobody nobody grabs onto that quote, Tim. I know just, nobody grabs it's onto okay it. Not... Ohio State. Yeah. So, man, this is I don't know. I'm fired up. Uh, this is a biggie, and I just hope Notre Dame. I, all I want to win is by one damn point. I don't give a damn. Win by one. Just shut up, Ohio State. That's what I want. So I'm let's fired. assume let's fired. assume that Ohio State fans are going to watch this podcast. Good. Um. Oh man, I I cannot tell you how hard I'm biting my tongue. <laughs> And we're not saying, Ohio State fans, that Notre Dame is going to win the game because our athletes go to class. That's not what we're saying. Oh, it's, it's a um, we're just saying in terms of the way that we operate, we do things the right way. Point blank, period. Um, and if we still come out and kick your ass and then wake up and go to class Monday morning, it's the best of both worlds. With, I mean, with, yeah, with, with, without it, let, me, let me ask you a, qu a quick question, Mike, since obviously you've played in you know, some top 10 battles and whatnot. It's like, Played my best games, Tim. Played my best games in those games. <laughs> how many tackle? How many tackles in 04? You said 14. Oh I, yeah, Michigan, like 14, a couple for loss, and I think I had 14 against Tennessee. And my linebacker coach didn't like me, and he rotated me out in all those games. <laughs> I didn't play, get to play a whole game. So you know what? Let me let me ask you this. Obviously, as someone with the you know captain in the Notre Dame, you know the pressure. I mean, it, it's there. When, when you go in a game like this, do you? I mean, do you feel it? Do you think about those things? Do you think of Mike Goolsby? You know, I mean, when, I mean, fans know Mike Goolsby, the pick six, the you know, upset top ten Tennessee. That play is going to live on forever. It's like, what are those moments like? I guess afterwards. God bless YouTube. It will live on forever. Yes. I mean, going into that game, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna feel that excitement. I can remember. I lived in the city of Chicago when the Bears made their last Super Bowl run. And that energy in the city was palpable, like throughout the playoff run, like you could feel that buzz. So that campus is going to be a buzz. Those players ought to acknowledge it. But I think really like if I go back in time and you're in the locker room before some of those games and it's just like, you just get with your brothers and it's like, this is about us, you know? And it's like, you're going to play hard. Uh, but it's just, it comes down to whatever's in that locker room, whoever's on that sideline with you. That's what matters. I mean, and then, you know, Derek Curry, I reference him almost damn near every show. You know, we, 
carried that team, that Tennessee game, at least we felt like it. I think we wanted to shoulder that responsibility, right? This is kind of what I'm talking about. And um, like after the, after the game, you mentioned after the game, Tim Derrick was crying, you know, and it was more of joy, but it was also exhaustion. Cause it's like, you know, you, tr- you were so dialed in and so focused and this was on the road. Um, but it's like, you know, when people say, give it everything you've got, you do have the opportunity to do that as a player, Tim. It's rare that you actually do. Uh, but this is one of those games. It's like you pull out everything you have. And that, that, goes, that goes into preparation prior to kickoff as well. You know I love what? I love it. I love that Tim Hyde's fired up. I love that Mike Goolsby's fired up. I think we need more fire in Bring the show. Out. So it is time. For the collab, it's here, folks. We got John Kennedy from Always Irish. Let's go. It's very what? nice to join you guys. Thank you for having me. Although, Mike, I got to give you some crap for this. You, the deuce is loose, and then I got to follow that. Thanks a lot, buddy. I see where I'm slotted in this arrangement. Thanks a lot, buddy. Let's make John follow the big new quarterback. Great. Thanks. The deuce, the oh, deuce is loose. Uh, somebody make a T-shirt, John. Hurry up oh. and patent that. The deuce Trademark is it. loose. Uh, Tim and Mike, it's good to be with you for the first time. I've I've uh, bothered Mike Singer before, but it is my first time being with you gentlemen. It, it's just, it's good to be with you. And you guys, I'm sitting there for five minutes. You covered half of my notes. So we must all be on the same wavelength. I had things written down. You guys are nailing all of them and I appreciate it. Um, first things first, I got a question for you, Goolsby. I got a serious question. I got to ask this. Now, I know you are a fancy Joliet Catholic boy. Uh, Are you sure you're able to share this stage with the Kankakee Bishop Mack guy? Is that going to be okay for you to share the stage with the Bishop Mack guy there? Like a half hour south? Is that okay? Well, John, I'll share this with you. I was going to ask you where where you're from because I know you're a Chicagoland guy like myself. Joliet Catholic, brother, is anything but fancy. I mean, Joliet's a steel town. You know, those are blue-collar boys. But, John, I actually grew up in Elwood, which is kind of splitting the difference between a Kankakee and a Joliet. So we got the same roots over here, man. Yeah. you know, building off that, John, I'm such a fan of your show. There's times where literally I've laughed out loud. You know, last season you were talking about LSU and you were like Kelly out Kelly himself. And I, I watched it back three times. It still made me laugh. That's it. Uh, it. Mike, here's the other thing. I circled this three damn times. That business trip BS Kelly used to pull. I'm telling you, Mike, it's a mind frame. And that guy, you're going into the big house or Miami in 17. He's saying punch in, punch out, do your work and get out of there. It you, it was always wrong, Mike. He didn't know how to motivate these guys. He didn't know how to push those Lou buttons. He didn't have that. Yeah. He never figured it out here, and I'll never forgive him for it. Well, you know, and that's everybody's got different coaching styles, John. Everybody's got different DNA, um, and everybody kind of goes about their business differently. But yeah, I agree with you. Uh, one of the best things about your approach to covering the Irish, like you're not an X's and O's guy. You know, you're just not, which I dig it. You know, I try to wear a couple different hats in this role, yeah. but you really have got a pulse of the fan base. Uh, you do a tremendous job with that. So, you know, you're kind of on the podium speaking for Notre Dame fans as a whole. How do you feel three, four days in, in front of this game? Yeah, it's uh, and you know what, man, I do. I take that seriously, like as the show's grown a little bit and I have a little bit of a following and I meet people at the tailgate last week or whatever. And people say, you know, you give us a voice and put it out there. Well, I've always thought that, but didn't have a way to get it out. Like, so I take that seriously, kind of having the pulse of where everybody's at. Um, and here, here's the deal. Um, these moments don't come along all the time. Okay. These special weeks where everything builds and there's momentum and, the vibes are high and you're undefeated and everybody likes the young coach. Everybody likes the quarterback, all of that. Um, These weeks are rare. And we all know here, Notre Dame's record in these type of games, the last 20, 25 years has been very poor. I'm not even talking about the bowl games. You could even ignore that. Um, 
And so the first part is these moments are rare in weeks like this. Even just the build up, you got to soak it in as a Notre Dame fan. That energy that every morning the week goes on, your stomach's turning more and more, all of that. Like, that's what this is for. Like, you guys and, uh, and me, the dog days of summer, we're doing a stream. You got to come up with topics. There's not a lot of energy, but you got to keep going. This is the payoff. Like, this is the payoff. It doesn't get any better than this. So these moments are rare. They don't come along often. Notre Dame hasn't been good at in them. This one has a different feel, okay? This one has a different feel. I would contend, maybe you guys covered this. This is the best vibe buildup I've felt since Bush Push. Nothing in 2012 matched it. Even Michigan 2012, the goal line stand against Stanford, that didn't have it. 18 and 20 didn't have it. This is a vibe of all vibes. And I, it is just, if Notre Dame is ever going to have a set, of oper- a set of circumstances with which to take out one of these teams with that star power, it's all right there for you. So this is it. We've had it circled forever. Everybody knows what's on the line. Like, I just think it's different this time. Both mics, it's different. And the number one reason is you actually have a quarterback who you feel good about. He can throw the ball around. You don't feel like the only way Notre Dame can win it is a block punt and two pick sixes or something. Notre Dame's structured differently. They're built differently. And that changes the calculus to me. So I am flying high, and it's going to be wonderful. This is beautiful. Um. And that's so you're flying high, you're excited, right? So, yeah. in, in a word, to summarize your feelings, you're excited. I am. So, I am. Due, abs- is that I'm largely due to? Is that excited. largely due to having Hartman? I just feel like this team. When I look back at these big game Notre Dame fail moments, you know, we're running me my whole adult life, okay, and I'm sick of it. That's all I hear about every day on Twitter, everything. It's when I think of all these recent games, Notre Dame's just built differently. Like, I feel like we have an offense that can actually kind of do their part maybe in this game for once. And it's not just all if the tight end doesn't catch 20 balls, Notre Dame's three and out. Like, they're built different. And you're already, I know you guys, this is your lane primarily, but you can already see Freeman's vision for this roster changing. You're already starting to notice some of the depth and the way they're able to rotate more guys in and feel good about it. You could see that that DNA of the program changing, and I think it's for the better. Look at the recruiting. Look at the way this is going. Like, regardless of this single game outcome, Notre Dame is still trending up. Look at the recruiting alone. Look at the work Gino's doing. I love that guy, Gino. He might be my new favorite guy down there with them, working with the offense, recruiting his butt off. I love all of it. So I'm not saying, oh, Notre Dame's going to beat Ohio State, and I guarantee it. I'm not saying that, but I am saying this is the best I felt about them in one of these moments since, I mean, you name the last time Notre Dame had a quarterback you felt good about one of these games. It's been a while, and that is a new kind of hope. Not a typical Notre Dame hope of like, I hope we do good somehow. This one is grounded in that a little bit, and it changes things. It's interesting. So you talked about we're built different this year as opposed to years prior. There is no real, you know, there is no Michael Mayer. There is no go-to guy in the passing offense up to this point. Kind of spread it around, which is nice. Uh, We still believe in the potential of the wide receiver group. I am so interested yeah. when you compare Estime and Sam, it's like, who's the better player, right? So if I'm Ohio State, I'm Jim Knowles, yeah, I'm trying to pick my poison. Who am I going to take away? That's going to be interesting because we don't have a stud wide receiver. We don't have a go-to guy yet, you know? So it's, but we do have that kind of point person hammering the ball. So that's going to be interesting to see in this game. Who does Ohio State focus on? Yeah, and that's the other thing, man. I've really been thinking about this. Um, 
Notre Dame doesn't have like that A1 go-to wide receiver dude or whatever. You don't have the stud tight end yet. I think Holden stays is turning into a hell of a player. He's just going to keep getting better. Um, uh, you don't have that. But what Notre Dame does feature is there's just more guys that can hurt you different ways than what we are used to. Like in this game, all uh, multiple of those backs we have could hurt Ohio State in different ways. Are they going to find a way to get uh, Price out there and Love out there and, get, and find some room and some space to get them a couple balls? Like you get, I just feel like Notre Dame has more to throw at a defense to worry them than what I'm used to. And that alone – Makes me feel better about this. It's not yeah. all on the defense this time, I hope. Yeah, I think uh, we'll get to the defense. And, Mike, if Tim's still there, I mean, Tim's got a ton of thoughts. I can't tell you how much work Tim has put into this breaking down film. Oh, I liked it. Tim was getting worked up, and it was exciting me backstage. I liked, I, I liked that, man. And well, I, feel the, I feel the way you do about those Ohio State fans, Tim. I thought... You're getting your brains beat in by Michigan every year, and I thought maybe they would tone it down a little bit since they aren't even the rulers of their own domain. Here we are, and they're running their mouths just like ever. I thought maybe they would come down a notch when they don't even own their own situation anymore, but I was wrong. They are all full force. They're going to blow Notre Dame out. I've been hearing it all week. It's funny you say that because, you know, I was – uh on the highway a little today, John, and I was, I, was, I put on your, uh, you had a call, your calling show today. And I, I got the first half in, man, I was, I was fired up. You're like, you know, like coach speak, man. Get, you know, I'm like, get his butt in the damn locker room. Let's go. It's like, that's what we need. It's like, come on. Who cares what the coaches say? Let's listen to the damn fans. It's I like, just, this just stuff just, uh, it, this week, man, all of us doing this content anywhere you look, you can hear it in people's voices and see it in their faces, how everybody's so just electrified for this. Um, and that leads me to a question, another question for you, uh, Mr. Goolsby. As a Notre Dame captain, leader of the team type guy, this has really been on my mind, and I'm dead serious about it. As a leader entering one of these moments with this buildup and this vibe and everything built into it, how do you make sure all of our guys are jacked to the gills, ready to run through a wall, but without being un out of control? How do you got, how do you regulate that? You want these guys jacked for this game, but how do you toe that line so that it's controlled and you're not running around there just crazy, but you have that little extra that comes with one of these games? How do you navigate that as a leader on one of these teams in the locker room? Great question. Um, so give me a second, John, because I want to give that its, its due. I think as a leader, I think, I think first, first of all, and Tim, you've been in leadership roles. I think that leadership is something you're born with personally. I think when kids try to pick their spots and they want to be vocal, but then I can flash back to summer when you were dog in a workout, your words mean nothing to me. So I think that leadership is really kind of, it takes hold during the summer and you have to outwork your own teammates. Fast forward to an Ohio state game week, John, I, as a leader have got to be prepared. I got to take care of my own shit. You understand? So when, when it comes to, when it comes, I can't make a, I can't miss a read. I can't, et cetera. Like I got to take care of my own stuff. Then I go leading up to Saturday and I'm confident. You feel me on that? Like I'm confident. And I think the getting them jacked up thing happens the night before the game and it happens in the locker room. I can remember giving a speech on the field before USC and granted we probably lost by 38 points, but I damn near passed out. I mean, I was yelling so hard. It was raining. I was like, maybe we got a chance. And I can remember like I, I got like a head rush cause I was yelling so much, but I think that leadership, it's like, if you're Bertrand, if you're Hartman, if you're one of these guys, um, Take care of your own shit throughout the course of the week. And then who's going to talk Friday night and then, you know, kind of cement that messaging. And then the day of the game, you know, the locker room pre kickoff thing. Um, that's when that, you know, that surge comes, but John, you got to do another thing at halftime because this isn't a cage fight. You know, this isn't a 15 minute ordeal. This is a four quarter deal. So you can come out jacked up, but you have to find a way to sustain that and be able to like 
that leadership opportunity, John, last thing to put a, put, to put a bow on it. Great question. Some of that leadership in my experience has come like in the third and fourth quarters, you know, you're going to come out, that team's probably going to come out on fire in the first quarter just because, but where are we at? Who's got, who's going to grab the mic in the huddle in the third and fourth quarter when things are touch and go. Yeah. And I, I just, can I, I can always I say wanted... one other thing, John, can I say yeah, one other thing? Certainly. This is my uncle Rico, you know, moment, but I, you can go back and watch that TV copy of that Tennessee game. And like something was happening. I feel like the refs were a little wonky at that point. And I looked in the huddle, you can read my freaking lips. And I said, somebody step up and make an F and play. Like you could read it. And then boom, the next play had happened. Like I got that pick. So I was just like, man, something, you know, you're, you're in the tempo of the game. You're in the, you know, the sway of things. And you're like, all right, somebody needs to do something quick. And I was just lucky enough to get my number called, but yeah, it's like checking in with your team throughout the course of a game. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and well, let yeah, me say go ahead, Tim. No, I was going to say, let me say something off of Mike because you're right. I mean, you're going to, I mean, uh, Coach Parker said something. I think it was yesterday. Uh, the coordinators do their press conferences and someone asked about the environment and all that. And Coach Parker's like, I'm not saying a damn word. It's like, this, it's like, what the hell am I going to say? It's, it's like, these guys are ready to roll. That's why you're at Notre Dame. This is Iowa State. There's nothing to say. Practice, prepare yourself and go play ball. I mean, he, it was an awesome quote. It was something like that. Um, I loved it. But, but to go off of, yeah, I mean, you're going to come out hyped up as could be, but I know, you know, when I've coached and at college, it's like, you got three hours of this. So it's like, it's not 30 seconds. It's three hours mm -hmm. in high school. Hey, you got two hours, two hours, balls, the wall, energy, play your tail off and let's go suck it up for this little period of time in your life. It's those types of things. But, um, but that goes back to what Gould's just said is the training. I mean, Mike Goolsby, I don't know if you know, John, is, I mean, his, his, his strength and conditioning coach is some dude up in Columbus, coach Mickey Mirati. So, you know, that's who trained Goolsby in Notre Dame back in those days. And that's obviously what Matt Bayless has done. It's preparing them for 60 minutes. Uh, this game, it's, it's really what it is. The first month has been a scrimmage. Fans have hated me for saying this for a month. Well, Tim, you can't take anyone lightly. It's Notre Dame. You're going to kick the hell out of these guys. You better. Because if not, then we got the wrong leader. And I've said that. People don't like that. If Notre Dame's 2-2 two and two going to Ohio State, who cares about Ohio State? There needs to be a lot more things done around Notre Dame. But Marcus Freeman's gotten these guys going. Coach Bayless got them ready in the summer. This is what they've trained for. Same with Ohio State. They have their three scrimmages. It's go time at 742, whatever the heck kick kickoff is on Saturday night. And it's going to be, it's going to be freaking intense for about three and a half hours when you add in all the NBC commercials. So it's going to be a war. Yeah. I've got, it, an, I got, I've, I've got another thought and John, thanks. I'm not going to sleep tonight, by the way, you got me all amped up after that. But, I, uh, sorry, man. That's my part of this, man. I'm not going to be the guy <laughs> breaking down film on the X's and O's, but no, it's but if great. you need it's somebody great. to go in there and get somebody fired up, dial it up. I can remember our first game my senior year. We're playing at BYU, lost the game. I had two big missed tackles, came free as a bird on blitzes. Didn't play my best game, but I can remember before the game, like one of our DBs who they love to chirp is going, they weren't out there pushing these trucks. They weren't out there doing these tire flips. And I'm like, yeah, they were. All of us condition. All of us lift weights. I mean, all of us, summer football, summer training, winter conditioning, whether you're at Eastern Michigan, whether you're at Notre Dame, it's hard. So like I said, when it comes into a game like this, who's going to step up and make a play? Who's going to be brave? Who's going to make that big hit? Who's going to go up for that contested catch? Yep. You know, I mean, we've all got a baseline of conditioning, um, some probably better than others. But it's like in this game, you know, you have to like visualize it like the night before and be like, yeah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And like you can become a legend in a game like this, man. You really can. Yeah. It, it, and, you know, you kind of touched on this and it's something else I wanted to make sure that I brought up from the player aspect of this. You know, we're all wrapped up in the fan build up and the media build up and in our shows. A lot of people have interest this week. You know, everybody everybody wants to, to get a, a piece of it. Uh, and we're all looking to the weekend and we're all looking to Saturday. I would like to know as a player, what is the week of practice like? when you're entering one of these games, it's not central Michigan. It's not, you know, Tennessee state. I want to know what it's like that week leading into a game like this. 
Is there a different vibe around the, those practice fields? Does everybody know? Is there like an automatic switch where it's like, all right, guys, this is a different week and everybody just automatically gets it and they're in work mode? Or like, what's that vibe like in the practice sessions building into this kind of big game? Yeah, I mean, and I was, we played in some big games and we were like, you know, when we knocked off Tennessee, we were like 500 or something. Like we weren't 4-0. We didn't have a Sam Hartman as our quarterback, the landscape of college football was a little bit different. So what I'm arguing, John, is that this is even going to be more ramped up in practice. But yeah, I think it's even down to the scout team guys, you know, like if you're that, you know, red shirt freshman, it's like, damn, you know, you feel the weight of the world trying to get that team ready. I think the practices are ironically a little bit less physical in some of these weeks because I can't explain that, but everything moves faster. So yeah. you're gonna, you're not gonna maybe thud up as hard because maybe you're trying to protect your teammate because he's got to go to battle in a few days. But absolutely, it's pervasive, and uh, the speed changes. I think the sense of urgency changes. Um, and then if you don't know what you're doing, like <laughs> that anxiety is a lot higher. You're like, shoot, I don't remember what my check is based off of this motion. Like you're freaking out. So I, I, I can't overemphasize like if you're that linebacker you're you're Jalen Steed and you're not quite sure it's like pull Max Bullet to the side and make sure you're double sure don't be embarrassed because you ought to know and you still don't like seek out your coaches this week um, because again the stakes are so high yeah yeah I mean the stakes you know it's just Tell me if you guys disagree. Maybe, maybe you do. And maybe I'm just out of my skis with my, you know, in my basement here, all in Notre Dame world. Tell me if I'm, I'm misreading this. But when I look at the profile of this game and what it could change for Notre Dame, they have a real opportunity. And I look at it as one that goes far beyond just one win or loss, you know, in this year. I look at this game against the talent that Ohio State has as Notre Dame's chance to say, for, I'm going to force people to look at Notre Dame different and I'm going to make them look at us different. And if you knock off this team, you're going to force that action. And there's still going to be people that would say, well, Ohio state's down that, you know how that is. Notre Dame's not going to win. Notre Dame beats them. And suddenly that team's no good. Right? Like I know, but this is an opportunity, man. These, this could change everything. This could be Notre Dame's opportunity to say, you know what? We're trying to move from, top 10, very, very good into the bottom of elite status. And this is the first step. Like what's on the line for this week to me on the upside for Notre Dame, it could change the trajectory of all this very, very fast. Um, regardless of what happens over all the rest of the year, if you could get a feather in the cap on this one and show at full strength that you could take them on and beat them, that moves the damn needle in a way we haven't had since before I could drive. Tim. Uh, Man, yeah, no, big time, big time. I think it changes a ton. Of like, am I exaggerating that, or or is that the read you guys have too? Like, I'm not trying to make it a bigger deal than it is, but that's really well, it is. The, Hold on. how it is real. A, but it is a big deal, and it, you know, and I think I think it's okay to have a big deal here at the end of September, or September 23rd, or whatever. I think it is a big deal because it is Ohio State, and it's this whole concept of Mike Singer's talked about. The, you know, he and I have talked about this many times on Wednesday night of of making you know Notre Dame cool again so to speak since Freeman's been there and yep. and the recruiting and the way they just do things the pot of gold so yep. many things that they've done obviously the the Shamrock ser series vids that they've done the you know the green one for with SMA and Hartman all those things you take care of Ohio State it's also those three little letters NIL is out there those things start to happen for I'm thinking transfers older guys it starts to be like man look what notre dame's doing why the heck am i playing at purdue i'm a you know first team all big 10 left guard why don't i go to south bend or if i'm a wide receiver at utah state 1500 yards the heck am i doing here because those things start to happen i think it's a huge national game for that sure it's game five you still got duke i'm telling you man if they take you go out you take care of ohio state these dudes aren't just sitting back chilling they got the whole season ahead of them, and it's lining up perfect for them to go put themselves in the history books. And those things matter when you're Notre Dame fandom and all those things. And you're right, John. It's sitting right there. This is a massive event for Notre Dame to just kill. I showed you guys that step. 
that stat earlier, you know, since 1994, after since 93, this is only Notre Dame's 25th time in a top 10 game, 10 versus 10, you know, two top. That's it. Ohio State's been in 28 of these since 2014. That's insane. So that's a long dry spell for Notre Dame. And now you start getting into these over and over again and the talent, the recruiting. Yeah, just go from there. And uh, th- I want to ask you guys this too. And you kind of hinted at it, Tim. Um, and Mike Singer, feel free to jump in here since it's your show after all. Feel free, buddy. I don't want to over... I'm the- it's your show, man. But you're just sitting there taking it all in. I was going to say, speaking of dry spell, it's been 40 minutes since I spoke. But go ahead, John. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you guys this, that 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 you know more about this stuff behind- than I do behind the scenes. Um, it seems to me that Year two, Marcus Freeman appears to me to be much more comfortable, much more confident. It looks like he has adjusted some of his messaging and the way he approaches things, both in philosophy and practically. I also feel like I like the vibe on this staff. I think this is a good blend. And what I've seen the first month is they've come out as a pretty good, clean operation. Well put together. They seem very organized, like in the games, everything's kind of... There isn't this panic and what are we doing? Um, I'm wondering if you guys have sensed that too. Freeman seems way more comfortable year two. uh, And he's humble enough to admit he didn't think he knew all the answers. And he's willing to shift and adapt where it it needs to be. He doesn't have that ego that some people have where he thinks he knows it all. Do you agree with that? I like this staff and I like what I see from Freeman year two. Let me jump in real quick on the recruiting side of things. I think it's a well-oiled machine. I, I think there had been some um, animosity maybe with, with some of the Brian Kelly staffs. I think especially when Freeman came in, I think there was some of the old guard and the new guard, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I just think it's – I mean, Freeman hired all these guys. Like even when he was – you know, I mean, he didn't hire Mickens, but he's literally – childhood best friends with Mickens and then he hired Chris O'Leary the safety coach when he's defensive coordinator so I think that's apparent on the recruiting side of things and then yeah in terms of the game day operation they need to clean up the penalties but otherwise John I'm with you and I think Freeman has been pretty open and honest about like these are things I said in year one I'm singing a different tune in year two Goolsby what are your thoughts on this yeah I think the um the coaching staff there's connective tissue. There's history there. These are Freeman's guys. And I mean, I'm, I live in Nebraska now, John. So I watched that with a Scott Frost when he was hired here, he hired all of his boys and it was a dumpster fire. Um, You mentioned humility. I think some of the guys that he's plugged into these roles, like a Gerard Parker for one to me, seems incredibly humble. Um, He's a hundred percent ball, you know, coach Reese, I don't feel like he was that humble of a guy. I just, I just don't, you know, with different backgrounds. Um, and I wanted to just jump back. I had a, what I thought was a good thought here, John, does this game, is this, is this going to force the college football world to look at Notre Dame differently? I think that Marcus Freeman has been a part of that. You know, the guy is super charismatic. He's in great shape, great dresser. Yep. He's out there. He's at the White House. You know, yep. he's he's doing things off the field to make Notre Dame more relevant. Yep. Tim, you yep. mentioned and three. Now, now, Mike, here's the thing. This is a very, very, very important thing to me. And this is something that I oh, talk you love about Freeman. all the time. You love Freeman. I'm just telling you, I'm a vibe guy, man. And if the vibe isn't right at Notre Dame and you're around Notre Dame enough, you will feel it and you will know, even if things are going decent, you have this nagging feeling like something just isn't quite clicking on all cylinders. Like if you're around Notre Dame enough, you start to feel that. And I'm telling you, Freeman, it's that the relationships, the personality, the humility, and that matters everywhere. I would argue it matters more at Notre Dame because Notre Dame's just so unique in the way of everything. Those relationships and the way that all those vibes are matter. And I feel really good about it, man. This is a guy everybody wants to see succeed. He's our guy to hate. You you know what I mean? He's our guy to hate. Usually everybody hates Notre Dame. It's hard to find a reason not to like this guy. So I, I just, the way he operates, is to me the vibe we've been missing here for a long time that doesn't promise any you know uh championships 
but I think it makes it more possible because those vibes are right. And I, that could just be me and my emotional Notre Dame thing, but I feel that, and I like the way it feels right now. No, I'll say as you know, as a uh, as someone that you know pretty much listens to every press conference Notre Dame puts out when I'm cruising the roads and things of that nature is, yeah, Freeman last year every year was like, oh, this is you know this week, this week, every week was a different you know, new thingamajigger that they were going to do, you know, a new slogan. And he, as a head football coach at Notre Dame, the rookie head coach he was, was like, oh, my God, I'm doing all this wrong. And then finally, you can start to see it turn right around that midseason mark and obviously the way they finished. And Marcus Freeman has been on the – I mean, he has said only like six things the last six months. It's the same thing over and over and over again. And how do you know it's sinking in? Joe Alt was on with Andy Staples on the On3 Network, um, a, a podcast today. And Joe's talking, to, you know, that he's saying the same words as Marcus Freeman. You didn't hear a lot of that early last year. It was, oh, Marcus Freeman's cool, you know, the video when he got hired. But now it's the messaging and it's that one play, one game, one life, all those things that Freeman's talks about. And it's, it's sinking in and these guys are, are living that. And that's the mark of a football coach who's willing to look at his mistakes and change what he needs to do. And I think it's awesome. I'm jumping in. I'm jumping in. You son of a bitch. Go ahead. How dare you? Ooh, I, I, I was, I was on, on that finger, uh, the, that trigger, trigger finger quick. Okay. Super chat from, from Eric. John, give us your score for this Saturday. Notre Dame by a million. So, I mean, I can't do that. I write for the USA Today. I can't be putting in bogus scores just because I want them to be. This goes out in the paper, Mikey. Give me some credit. So I believe I did my preview for the USA Today Fighting Irish Wire. And I think I had 31-34 Notre Dame on a field goal late in a physical battle all night. Okay. I like it. Eric, thanks for the super chat. John, I want to know, okay, because I'm, I'm sure when people are watching this, they're looking around at all of our different reactions, right? John's talking for, for a couple of minutes. They're all looking around and I'm just sitting here cracking up. John, this is what I do. when I watch your show. I am so entertained, but also it's good stuff. Like guys go, go follow John Kennedy, always Irish on, um, on YouTube. Follow. I, I put your Twitter under your name there too. So always Irish ring. follow him on Twitter. Absolutely fantastic. You know, he's not some media guy like me. Or sometimes, honestly, I do have to filter some things. John has none. I love John Kennedy. Okay. John, is this just what you're like all the time? Like when you're like, what cheese do I want? Damn it. Like, what do I want here? I mean, what, what, what do I want? I mean, is this just you all the time? You're just this fired up. I mean, look, you got, you got my, my blood rate going, man. Is it's, this just you all the time? It's just, I've, I've gotten asked this before and here's my answer to that. This is, it would be way too hard to act the way I do for as many hours of a week that I'm streaming and doing video. Do you know how much more work it would be for me to fake something? Like, like never have I had a bullet point. And then I go, make sure you turn purple and yell here. You know what I mean? Um, but the thing is, guys, Notre Dame is what does this to me. Like, if you want to talk about how bad my White Sox are, I'll be mad, but it isn't going to have that personal touch to it. Like, Notre Dame is just different. I'm telling you, man, since I was a little kid, this is all I've ever wanted to do. There's nothing else I wanted to do. I wanted to talk about Notre Dame my whole life. Once I realized I was a skeleton who was never going to be a great athlete and I, I just golf, that's when I realized all I want to do is talk about Notre Dame. Um, but it just, it just comes out, Mike. I don't know. I just get excitable. And then whatever comes out, comes out. And then that's what's out. Like, I don't know, man. There's just something about live streaming and then just things just come out um, of, of maybe even your body. I mean, this is this is just good stuff. Well, not uh, on ratings. my show, but if it's good for the ratings, I might try it. <laughs> well done. Well done. All right. Uh, I'm glad you guys picked up what I was putting down there. Just, yeah, I got you. Uh, I, you know, I always like to make some jokes. All right. Last thing, and then I'm going to throw it over to Ghouls. Good I, thing Ghouls you had Deuce on before, right? Okay, I'm done. I promise. I'm done. I promise. <laughs> Just because I want to fire you up, John. Hold on, hold on, Singer. Are we supposed to keep saying deuce and number two or is that off limits from now on? I mean, people are like, Mike, you got to stop censoring everyone. I'm like, did I censor you guys? Did I tell anybody they're not allowed to say anything? I mean, hey, you guys can, hey, let them fire. Let them fire. 
But anyway, Cole said, OSU Insider just said, Notre Dame's best receiver plays corner for us now. Um, John, you have the floor, sir. Dude, I, I, these people are outrageous. I saw a video the other day on, on who was it? Mark Rogers, a close friend. I like Mark Rogers, the voice of college football. I did a couple shows with him. I, he's got a guy on there that's a beat writer for OSU saying Notre Dame fans are going to be funneling out in the late third quarter blowout, not even going to be close. Notre Dame has no players anybody's ever heard of or wanted to recruit. And this wasn't some guy just like with a microphone. He's he's an OSU beat guy. So I don't understand where the disconnect is. Are we the ones misreading all of this for thinking Notre Dame matches up better with these guys this year? Or are they in OSU dreamland. Like I'm having trouble figuring out maybe I'm missing the boat and I'm, I'm going to look dumb Saturday night. I don't know, but I don't see it that way. I, I just the, don't see it that way. I saw the same clip, John. You know, that guy looked like a job of the hut knockoff. You know, nah, he uh, was an egg with glasses. He's an <laughs> egg with glasses. That's it. That, uh, Oh yeah. I want to see what's on that guy's hard drive. Uh, what a creep. But, um, yeah, but it's so on brand for Ohio State. It's just so on brand. That's who they are. It's just it's just who they are. Oh, my you God. Know? Per- perfect, Goolsby. That is Ohio State. Yes, yes. I'm just glad that's on your record and not me, buddy. That was a good one. I like that. That's hey, man. Good. Uh, I got instincts. But, yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's just – it's on brand for Ohio State. And uh, it, it, it's your, we've got to kind of shift this this conversation into talking ball. We got to. You mentioned earlier, John. Again, is this a game to make people look at us differently? And I think, depending on how we play, the game plan that we try to push out there, uh, how exciting we look. That's what's going to change the narrative. So if we come out there and it's just ground and pound, and to your point, we block a punt, make some miraculous play, I don't know if that's going to shift the narrative. I mean, Marcus Freeman is doing all he can to make us hip, to make us relevant. Notre Dame, you know this, John, can be very stuffy. I love all of your commentary about you know the alums and sitting on their hands. I agree across the board. Marcus Freeman's making us less stuffy, and we're still classy. You know, like you look at Josh Heupel on a sideline, the guy looks like shit. And you look at like Marcus Freeman, it's like he's we're better for TV. We just are. But in terms of the game plan, Tim, that we're going to roll out offensively, just just go along with me. If, if we can air the ball out, if we can make things a little bit more compelling, get on a Sports Center top ten, does that serve? Does that help our cause in terms of changing? the narrative about Notre Dame football, what do you expect to see offensively? Uh, man, if you're asking me, it's, it's, I mean, Notre Dame's going to be who they are. They're, they've been really good in 12 personnel with two tight ends. They're going to have to hammer with Estime. And then you and I have been, Goolsby have been talking about these wide receivers forever. And it's like, you just need one of them, man. I have been waiting for Tyree just to, take off and this is the game to do it. So I would love, you know, I'm, I'm hoping he's, I'm hoping he's the MVP because he's got the wheels to do it. So I don't know who else does on the outside, use him a little bit, but um, yeah, your, your ESPN comment to me just has to be one play. Just got to have one, that one play that's just played on a loop. It starts the show every single hour on top of the hour. And Man, I'm going to th- talk about this until the game ends. But, I mean, this is Sam Hartman. That's why he's here. I'm not here for Central Michigan 350 yep. last week. Who gives it? Seriously, who yep. gives a rat's ass, right? It's like yep. it's Ohio State. It's SC. It's those things moving up. It's Ohio State. That's why you're here. This is his 50th. I, I can't even count to 50. This is his 50th start. It's like, my God, use all that experience. And, you know, and, and Singer and I, and I know Goolsby, we've chatted about it a thousand times. It's like he's not, you know, there's no alpha. There's no Michael Floyd. There's no dude on the outside. There's no Claypool. So he's using his experience and finding one of five. And he's got to find one of five because the Buckeyes are fast as hell. They are blazing on defense. So he's got to find one out of those five when he throws it. And I think this is going to be a game. He's He's got to throw it 35 plus times in this game. Yeah, and then let me ask you guys this. You're talking about, <clears throat> you know, some of the plays and what what we might want to see, and and I don't know the answer to this either. You know, you hear about 
uh, teams holding stuff back, you know, for a big game, or you don't want people to have film on what you want to do. How much do you guys expect to see new that we haven't seen yet on either side of the ball, anything coming from Notre Dame? You know, I just don't know what's realistic or not, but, but surely there's got to be a couple wrinkles they didn't want to put on film for Iowa State. But what would you anticipate those that might be and how much of that you might get? My wrinkle is motions with Tyree, some sort of a wheel route with Tyree. Yep. I, 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 I'm just, you know, and, and rewatching some of the games over the, you know, over the last weekend and whatnot, Tyrese, you know, he's, he's made a few plays here and there and it's like, he's got this speed cause he's at a slot. So he's going to be matched up with one of their nickels. So he's got that speed, the outside, the Buckeyes got two really good corners. And I don't think Notre Dame's blazing fast outside. I just don't, you know, it's, it's just my humble opinion, but I think Tyree, and if they find some way to get love with estimate together and, People are focused so much on Estime. Yep. How do you get love out of the backfield yep. matched up with on Chambers or Eichenberg, someone like that? Because I'm telling you, man, when you, you watch love, he's ready to go 99 yards every time he touches the ball. That guy is just like cannon waiting to go. So Tyree, find a play for love because those guys got extra gear to take it the distance, uh, especially on offense. So when you say – Hold stuff back. I think Notre Dame, who's there, they're not going to come out and be a five wide team this week. They got a really strong run game, really strong tight ends. They're going to feed estimate 25 plus. You're not going to see the whole five headed monster this week. You're going to yeah. see one and a half. So feed him, but find your two fastest dudes on the team. Get them the ball somehow, some way in a secret formation that they haven't shown. I think, I think just to add to that, we, when we talk about wrinkles, John, you know, expanding the playbook, we've got stuff holstered, stuff up our sleeve. We tend to think about off, you know, on the offensive side of the ball. I could see, I, I, I'm building off of what Tim said. I think Tyree is a mismatch piece. And as much as Ohio State loves to bring those interior kind of delayed blitzes we used to watch with the Bears, John, with Erlocker, you're going to see a lot of that stuff. I could see a, a screen to a holding stays, like a middle screen to a holding stays. I think. In addition to Tyree, you know, I'd love to see Raritan come back this week, but I think he just gives you a bit of an edge athletically. And then defensively, I don't still quite know what our defense is. I mean, there's there's probably too many wrinkles. I mean, um, last night, Tim, I went back and watched the NC State again, game, NC State game again. This this Aztec package, holy smokes! On one side, we've got Marist. Walked up, playing over the tackle, five technique. And then poor Jordan Botello. This is the fifth or sixth position he's played now. He's playing three technique, you know? So out there, you got Marist at 230. You got Jordan playing inside at 250. And then you got Cross and you got John Baptista. It's just like, boy, if we were ever vulnerable, I think John, Ohio State's going to try and run the ball. But run it right at us out of that formation. I mean, shoot, motion a wide receiver back in. I mean, yeah, Golden's defense scares me in this game. Uh, but offensively, my little uh, nugget might be like a middle screen to Holden stays. I could just see it. Yeah, I like that. Um, you know, my mind went to finding a way. Notre Dame's got more weapons to, available to them. I want to find a way to get multiple of those backs out there. Have my big boy estimate out there and then have uh, JD or Love somewhere running around, find a soft spot somewhere and all it takes is one cut. Some of that action, I like. I'm I'm all for that. Um, uh, you mentioned the defense. Here's something else. Like I've been saying on my show. I mean, I know we played a handful of games almost. I I still don't know for sure where Notre Dame's offensive line and defensive lines are at. Okay, I just don't know for sure yet. You know, you got a good little taste of it against NC State. I I mean, that's fine. But like, I want to kind of reserve until after this game i've been saying check back with me um what was that stat last year ohio state had 17 first down runs 16 of them were high efficiency meaning a good chunk of yards notre dame's dead then dude like you're dead like mm -hmm. just to start out if that happens again you're dead so notre dame's got to do a good job against the run and then find a way to heat up this young quarterback. He he may have a big arm, whatever. He's never been in an environment like this. Speed his clock up. Get in there. Make him start thinking there's footsteps behind him. They may not even be there. You got to speed that clock up. So 
I don't know what we're going to get, but I am really excited to see this. And I think Ohio State may be vulnerable at those tackles. I do. I don't care what the fans on Twitter say. I think there's some questions at left tackle over there. I, if ever there was a time to get around the edge for a night, this would be it. So I, I want to get those answers. No, I was going to say he is. Yeah, their left tackle, the San Diego State guy, is their lowest ranked guy for you know pro football focus by a mile compared to the other four. But, uh, man, you know, John and obviously Goolsby's a defensive guy. I, I'm i still going back and forth. It's like – because McCord, he's a third-year guy, so he's been around the block. You know, he hasn't been, obviously, in South Bend at 730 at night, but he's been in the program. He's been a part of these, and it's like – and when Notre Dame blitz, it scares the hell out of me. It just it just does because it's, it's frightening, okay? Even though they're better at the back end, it's just – Every time I see someone start to that could be its own three hour stream. We could just complain. I could complain about the blitzes, okay? (laughs) Who they're sending, when they're sending them, what it looks like, how far away it is, and why it's a half second late. Did I cover it all? (laughs) Well, and and the lack, John, you did. You missed one. It's the lack of sacks, right? Yeah, that's all you missed. The yeah. Seriously, I still wake up some two, you know, two a.m. Sometimes I'm just a little thirsty. Walk down, and it's like. Did I just see a double safety blitz in Columbus? I, I think of this about six times a week. So it's still there. But it is frightening. And do you just drop? Because because the Notre Dame D-line, are they are they gonna get pressure out of the front four? Do you just play it safe? Yeah, do you just cover? It's it, it it's gonna be a, a a wild twist to see what Coach Golden does. Dude, Tim, Tim, and, you're making me feel gonna, good. Tim, you make me feel good. I thought I was the only guy laying there at night with my Irish head on the pillow, tossing and turning this week. It was like one, it was like one in the morning last night and I couldn't sleep. I got out of bed and wrote an article because I'm like, I can't go to sleep anyway. May as well do something useful. I'll just type it up. You're making me feel normal, Tim. You may want to go get checked out. All right. You know, because Goolsby and I, you know, you know, when we talk X and O's, we talk defense a lot. It's like, you know, what are the fits sometimes? What are they doing? Are they trying to over it sometimes with some of these safety fires and all that stuff? But, um, and I'm, to me, I'm just nervous because you, you, who's covering those guys? And if you're going to be an all-out blitz guy, this game may come down to how does DJ Brown and Ramon Henderson cover slots when they're bringing Harper and Watts and guys like that. And that, and, and that just gets a little nervous sometimes. Outside, I think they're going to be fine. I think we're going to see NFL wars outside with Hart and Morrison matched up against their two freaks. It's going to be awesome to watch that. It's going to be that inside. Same thing on offense. It's going to be the guard play. Coogan and, and the Rock. You know, how's Rocco hold up against Mike Hall, who's a hell of a pass rusher? So it's going to be that up-the-gut safeties and guards probably on both sides. Yeah. I love you. I laughed really, really hard because I pictured Tim getting up at two in the morning and thinking Notre Dame ball and being like, I might as well go deep into some archives to do some crazy statistical research. Because, Tim, I see you doing that. Oh, this, 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 I've enjoyed this so much. I, I do, this is just not ending anytime soon. Um, Tyler and Jack, I know you guys are backstage. I, I don't know what to tell you guys. I, I, I can't stop this. This is just too good. I'm Michael, I'm going to throw to you. This, this, is, this is just amazing. I, I'm having such a great night. Mike, go ahead. I'm thinking of John and Tim. Both you guys just can't. It's like sleepless in Seattle with like a Notre Dame spin, you know? These guys breaking down film late at night. But I think our role here, guys, isn't to be like create, uh, you know, panic, right? Because we, we can be concerned about interior line play, right? We can be concerned about bringing pressure um because we don't want to rain on anybody's prey but it's just something to watch when you're watching that game can riley mills riley mills howard cross they get plenty tim opportunities to beat a guy one-on-one in a pass rush scenario like you see a lot of bull rushing it's like god you know where is a move um at washington can we teach these kids a move and maybe a counter move i can do it with high school kids i'm sure coach washington can do it with a d1 athlete but back to the offense defense I listen to a lot of sports betting podcasts, gentlemen. You get an interesting perspective. Uh, bet the board, college, just give them a little a shout out. Bet the board, do it. They do a tremendous job breaking down games. Thus far this season, the Notre Dame defense has created a 10% havoc rate. Not great. Um, run stuff rate, Tim, 
So based off of the, the schedule that we played thus far, all those cupcakes, you know, and 17% of the time, like they're getting what, quick math, 80, yeah. 83% of the time hey, they're getting plus yardage. I got it real, uh, real quick, real quick here. Yeah. I, I, I got the stat. Notre Dame's got 17 TFLs for the season, 17 against scrimmages, 17 TFLs, tackles for loss, four, four have come from the starting front four hmm. and four games against a one double a team that Tennessee state is not, if Youngstown state played t- Youngstown, Ohio state played, obviously Youngstown would have beat them 42 to seven. I mean, come on. So there, that was not a good football team. And this is, so, this is what we're saying, Tim. So this isn't scares me Four TFL four havoc pressure plays against the run and, and they play Navy. That's all they do is run. So that's a little interesting tidbit when you look at their total. Uh, and you're not knocking the players. You're knocking the scheme because it seems like, John, you turn the damn game on and there's people blitzing everywhere. But it's like, where is where is the havoc? Where are the negative? Where are those negative plays being charted? So that's just it's uh, that's what I'm going to continue to watch this game. But I, I mean, I think we load the box up. Um, Kyle McCord, to your point, Tim, he's been around. He's got a hose for an arm. They've got first round draft picks. You know, the lot the wide receiver room is just littered with them. But, you know, McCord's stats, he's 11 of 29 with throws 10 yards plus in the air downfield, like depth of target, right? No, So not great. So, John, we love our corners. Best corners we've had since my ex-teammates, Vontez Duff and Shane yep. Walton. Yep, so right can we down. load the box and just trust those dudes to go be dudes? That's another thing I'm going to yeah. want. Yeah, and, and when I mentioned earlier, Notre Dame's coming in more equipped, it's easy to think about the offense with the shiny new quarterback, but on the back end as well, yes. that's also a feature we have not had enough of. You know, you would have Julian Love back there, you would have Kyle back there, but the issue always was, fine, but I need two or three of each. I don't need one of them. You know, I need two or three of those guys. So that's also encouraging on the back end. Um, but I, I just... All of these matchups, it, it ends up coming down to the oldest thing in football. Who's going to make plays at the line of scrimmage? Who's going to own the line of scrimmage? Uh, the other thing is, I think Notre Dame's going to need to make some big plays here. Benjamin yeah, Morrison, yeah. do you have another Clemson in you? Because we could use that one this week. What about week. Cam like, Hart? What about Cam Hart? John? Right. Yeah, somebody's going to have to – we're going to have to do that, I think, because we know the firepower they have. So if Notre Dame could steal a couple there. And then here's the other thing. You guys mentioned this when I was backstage. You talked about who flinches. Too many of these games, there seems to be a point where something goes bad on Notre Dame and then the whole – everybody sighs and it snowballs. And before you know it, it it unravels on us. Who flinches? And how do you make sure it's not us? How? What is that moment where we hit them in the face and they're at our place and they realize this is different this year? Like, I want to see some of that from us. Yeah, that's, uh, man, all I thought about as you said that is the, the Clemson playoff game. It's like, yeah, Julian Love goes out and Bond yeah. gives up one pass. Everyone freaks out. Ian Book's got a couple guys wide open you know, touchdown passes and just panics, doesn't get rid of it. Jeez Louise. Yeah. And that, by man. the way, good job by Clemson's coaching staff. They saw love out and the oh. very next thing they did is go to that guy. And that oh. was brilliant coaching. And I give them credit for that. Um, but well, that's I a just, great point. Real quick, John, that's a great point. You say, don't flinch. That's obviously a famous, you know, that was a Holtism that he just pounded into his program and his players. Don't flinch, make them be the first one to flinch, give something up and whatnot. So, um, yeah, you're right. I think, I think that goes back to the messaging. I think Freeman's saying that when you hear him speak, he's got so much of those things he's trying to incorporate in these kids of just 60 minute game. Keep playing. It's one play. You're down 14, three, who gives a hell? You got another play. Just keep going, get back into it and yeah. fight like crazy. So I think yeah. that's, you know, we're going to, but the defense the defense is going to be fascinating to watch because John is so correct. They got corners, corners. Goolsby played on one of the greatest Notre Dame defenses ever, and they could go nuts because they had corners. So use those. How are they going to use those two corners in this game? Is going to be it could be a legendary game to write about. Yeah, and I think John to answer your question in regards to flinching, if something bad happens, right? Who's going to step up? I mean, that comes down to that leadership thing, that preparation thing. It's like. And you've got Freeman's got this roster. 
we're, 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 we're almost there, brother. Yeah. You've got enough guys that have enough physical ability to call their own number and take that momentum back. So that's where, again, I always look at things through a you know, player's perspective, but it's like, okay, Sam threw a pick, we fumbled the ball, whatever is the case. It's like, yeah, I want to get back out there. You know, it's, it's my time to shine. So it's, and it's just like, yeah, it's the, the oldest, the, the oldest, you know, saying in the book, you know, big time players make big time plays and big time games. Yep. It's, it's true. Yep. And this is one of those opportunities. Yeah. Well, let's, well, let's say it again. It's that's the guy with the ball in his hand. This is, I mean, this, I mean, seriously, this is his high. So Tim, moment. say it then say it. So it what is. are your, what is your expectation of Sam? John, Tim loves to take it to a point. And then he just doesn't push it off the ledge, you know. What is my expect? Oh, my push it off the ledge. Full send, baby. Go full send. My oh, my expectations for this game is for him to be the dude. It's it's in front of him. Go take it. That's why he's he's here. That's why the guy's here. This 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 game. It's circle. This is it. The whole this is it. This is why you come to Notre Dame. There's no other reason. It ain't to beat Tennessee State. This is it. This is your moment. Where'd you go? I scared everybody away. They left hey, this show. This is it. No, but this is his high. Hey, if he beats Ohio State, all he's got to do is beat Ohio State or SC. I think he's going to go to New York. You beat Ohio State, he's instantly, instantly yeah. a Heisman finalist. Yeah. Because it is a moment. He's got a story. He's got all those things. All, you know, the, you know, I keep saying the rib bone, which I think is hilarious, you know, but just the looks, the Notre Dame quarterback, he's, yeah, yeah he, he literally is the face of the program, the first QB to be this since, you know, Mike Goolsby's old teammate, Brady Quinn. It, it just is. And Quinn yeah. was a two-time finalist, so in the top five of the Heisman. So it's right it, it's right there, man. I really hope he goes out and braces this. And he puts the team on his back. It's like, you're the, you know, you're the old man climbing up the hill, damn it. It's like, you put guys, the team on your back it's and just- be the dude. It's a calm operation. It's like a miracle. I tuned in for Navy and I'm like, what is this Notre Dame offense that's like under control? And it seems like everybody knows what they're doing and the quarterback's not panicking. Like everything, everybody just seems to kind of know what they're doing. Like, and I'm not making this up. This ain't the show for this discussion, but I'm going to mention it. Okay. I, one of the big things, no matter what happens the rest of the year, that I love most about this season, whatever's going to happen, is it's letting Notre Dame fans see a world where you have appropriate freaking quarterback play. And I have a theory on this I've been complaining about. I got to realize I'm getting old. There's a lot of these people that are like tw- in their 20s. All they've known in their Notre Dame brains is swamp thing. And his recruiting and his lack of development and how we handled the quarterbacks, that's all a big segment of this fan base knows. And it poisons your brain over time. Your Notre Dame brain, it's a, it grows. And then you start not knowing why you look around at a school you never heard of and they have an offense with guys running all over. And ours can't do diddly poo in a big game. The best thing about this year is it's making Notre Dame fans realize what it should look like here all the damn time. And fortunately, this new staff is recruiting and developing where I think this is going to be the new norm, where you're going to have those quarterbacks that can play. They're going to have high upside, and you're not going to be capped by that. That is the Notre Dame standard. It's a joke how long we went by with quarterbacks that weren't what Notre Dame should have or didn't develop into it or weren't evaluated right or whatever it is. I just want to be past all that. And all this Sam Hartman stuff's putting in in Notre Dame fans' brains. Oh, this is what it's supposed to look like here. And I love it. No, it's, it's, it, that's a great point, John. I think I've heard you make that on your show. And it's, it's, it's true. It's like Notre Dame fans are in an abusive relationship with our quarterback play. Yep. It's like they come to accept, like, un, it's unhealthy. Yeah. It's like, okay, now you're seeing healthy play from the position. It's like, this is what a healthy relationship is. You know what yeah. I mean? It's true. Tim, you said you want to see Hartman put the game on his back. I'm watching Deuce Knight clips. Like, that kid can put a game on his back. He can make a play independent of an offensive scheme. He can make a play if, you know, a Rocco Spindler gets ran over and there's a three technique in his lap. He can still make things happen. That's what I'm curious about, Sam, is how does he play in this game if and when he's under duress? Um, because well, we just haven't, technically, we haven't seen him move outside of the pocket and make plays in the run yet. 
Well, there, I mean, he's definitely going to be under duress. There's going to be moments where those, you know, those freaks up front are going to, they're going to get to him at times and whatnot. And that's going back to Hartman, you know, Hart, you know, bringing up Hartman at wake, you know, putting the team on his back, but the team on his back then was just going bombs away, Joe and chucking that thing all over the place. As we know, when I say put the team on his back, it's going back to, I got five guys. And if I got five guys going out in the pattern, I, me is the guy in my 50th start, the guy who is becoming the face of Notre Dame along with Estime. It's my job to find that son of a gun. And I think obviously, you know, hell, he's a six year senior. He's not going to class this week. So I'm sure he's hanging out with Parker at Parker's house each and every night, having dinner and watching film and charting plays. Every single play that's going to be called, he is going to know where every dude is. He has to. He has to know every guy what he's doing. And that's got to be, that's Parker's duty. Don't call a play unless Hartman knows where all five are. Because the Buckeyes are going to be coming from all angles. Sonny Styles, their nickel is if you, if no one's watched this guy, he's a freak. Five star. That dude's a top ten NFL draft pick. He is a freak. So you got to know where these guys are. And that when I say Hartman on his back, be the guy, man. We he's got to be the guy. He's got to be the guy. Right. Do I, I, I'm going to swim upstream. Last thing, singer. Yep. And as much as I love Hartman, do you? let not. Uh, forget about our boy Audrey Gastame. Yeah. Let's just not. I mean, so the narrative, it's fun. Again, it's sexy to talk about the quarterback play, but it's like we've got a, a real life, you know, monster in our backfield. And it's a different narrative to kind of try and sell, I guess. But, you know, Ohio State's lost to Michigan because they got punched in the mouth. And Ohio State's built to be speed, they're built to be athleticism. And then Michigan walks in there and just bullies them. It's like, Audric, Audric's Tim, John, Michael, he is built. He was put on this planet to do this. Yeah. But will ball. Notre Dame's offensive line support that effort enough against Ohio State's defense? Like, sure, if you're just going to let Estime run people over, he will. But I, do you have you guys have concerns about interior line players? Some of that run blocking, yeah. how's that going to go? I mean, it, it's there. up at night. No, exactly. It's there, but but Pat Coogan's been a I, he's a surprise player of the, of the team. He's been absolutely unbelievable for coming from nowhere, and now he's the the dude at left guard. Rocco's strength is run blocking. It mm. it sure as hell ain't pass blocking. It is bad. So um, you know that's where I mean Ohio State's going to run the fires, the twists, as Goolsby's talked about, right up Spindler's ass. They just are. It's it's going to happen. So just be prepared for it. But man, if they could just get enough enough blocks to make it, and and when they go twelve personnel and they run duo and and they just create, they basically the two tight ends are creating an extra gap is what it's doing, and he he finds that gap, which I will give kudos to estimate. He was not good last year at finding cutbacks. He is unbelievable at finding the littlest seams this year. He is making yeah. subtle changes in the box. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm with you. He's got to be a 25 plus carry guy. Hartman throw for 35, estimate 25 yeah. plus. And carry. that's a good balance, Tim. I like yeah. that balance. And, and and Notre Dame's going to need some balance to keep Ohio State a little honest here. I like that blend. John, I feel more confident in our ability to block the run than I do the pass. I mean, if I'm going to lose sleep, it's going to be over Rocco Spindler just being able to compete laterally, athletically, yeah. and even Blake Fisher to a degree. Uh, which is good because hopefully Blake comes back um, if he doesn't have the strongest showing. Yeah. But the, you know, the other thing too is like just from a linebacker perspective, John, like Audric, the way he plays, he's almost like having another, like maybe a, a half a blocker just because of the way he, he's going to run through every single arm tackle. You feel me on that? Yeah. So it's like you got your five guys down, you got whatever, we're in 12 personnel, we got seven block. Well, actually, we got seven and a half based off the way Audra carries the ball. So I just, I, I'm personally, I, I kind of want this to be the estimate show. Yeah, Let me, I, I'm all for it. And don't get, again, we don't have enough hours in this stream for me to go in on O-line U. And I, I have real problems when we're O-line U. And then in the biggest game of the year, we put up 56 rushing yards, but we're O-line U. 
I always have a problem with that. It, to me, you should be performing your best as a unit against the best teams if you want to be O-line you. Not putting up 54 yards and calling yourself let, O-line you. Let me push back on you, John, for a little bit, okay? There's only five of them. If Ohio State is bringing more than you can block, there's nothing the offensive line can do. So then what do you have to do? you got to put the ball in the air a little bit. Right, or, I mean, but, if, course, but I wouldn't... But I wouldn't be complaining about that if we ended up winning the games anyways. There are always games where we rush it for 56 and throw it for 100. Who gives a damn, right? Like, I got an answer for you. If, if we ran it for 56 and still beat Georgia, I'm not going to be as mad. But these, I'm just saying, I need a little bit more production in the biggest moments out of that group. It doesn't even have to be a lot to give estimate daylight and to keep Ohio State honest. Just give it to me this night. So well, let me... Well, let me get, uh, just jump on a point real quick to Goolsby because Goolsby and I were, you know, chatting the other day where Mike's just like, he he fully thinks, you know, you talk about this, Goolsby, is Ohio State's going to hammer the ball. And I kind of like that because he's sick of this narrative of Michigan's hammering me each and every year the last two years. And what was he so proud about last year, the way they smashed Notre Dame in the last two quarters? He talked about that. He talked about how his O line took over that football game and yep. bullied Notre Dame. So, yep, yep. I, I, there, I, I, there's I, nothing more humiliating than that no. either. When a got well, when a team is going to run it on you, and everybody in the building and everybody on TV knows they're going to run it, and there ain't a damn thing you could do to stop it. There's no. nothing more humiliating in football to me. Getting ran on when you know it's coming. There's nothing you could do. Well, I think Goolsby's I, right about that. Where Day might come into here with his, you know, his quarterback only in his four start, and he's got three backs that are dudes. And just be like, stop me, Notre Dame, with you know Howard Cross and all these other guys. Stop me. The over/under for this game total points opened at fifty-seven. I just checked, and we're talking tonight. It's down to fifty-five and a half, right? And I, you know, I said in our my last show on Sunday, I said I'm betting the under. Uh, I just that's what that's what I see. I mean, McCord coming into this environment. And we can be had in the run game, John, because we just don't play straight up. Back in the Stone Ages when I played, brother, it was just like, you're in an over front, I got this A gap, and I got this B gap. And it's like, let's line up and let's play. And Al Golden's, you know, looping people and dropping people, and it's this designer. I'm going to start calling it the designer defense. And um, it just doesn't work in a street fight, you know? And I think – Coming into this environment, it's going to be a street fight. I, I expect it to be – it would not shock me if it's zeros on the scoreboard coming out of the first quarter. I, I think it's going to be that type of a feel-you-out kind of game. They're going to take their shots. We're going to have to take yep. our shots. It's going to come down to tackling. And, gosh, it's so lame to say, but somebody has make to step up and make a play. Yep, make a play, man. And the other thing is – some of that to me is timing of it as well. I'm thinking about how electric this environment's oh, yeah. going to be. You got the green and we're doing the lights and we're doing the whole thing. And I know I'm an old guy. I'm not used to the DJ, you know, mixing. Oh, I forgot about the green I'm jerseys. not used to the DJ Jazzy Jeff during the timeout. I ain't used to all that, man. Uh, yeah, but, wait, wait, wait. Did he say DJ Jazzy Jeff? Look yes, that. I That's did. That. That's, that's how old right I there. am. I'm, that's how old I am, man. Uh, going back to the Fresh Prince when I was like 12. But I that surprised me. I get a little DJ action. But my point is, you're going to have all that build up, and the fans are going to be into it nuts and all that. I want to know that that first big play, what happens, whether it's for us or against it. If it's for us, it's just going to accelerate all that. Yeah. I want to see the reaction if Ohio State gets to add 10 nothing in the first quarter or something. I want to know how everybody reacts to that. The, the fans and the players, like those big moments and where they come can kind of shape how that night's going to feel. So true. John, you're like a football, like you're like a sociologist when it comes to like football because it, it's so true. They make a big play in the first quarter, not that big of a deal. They make right. a big play in the beginning of the fourth quarter, huge deal. Yeah, absolutely. And Mike, you got to realize you're talking to a guy with his master's in clinical psychology. So this is all the way I think, man. My brain's all messed up. That's how you end up in your basement yelling about Notre Dame all the time. Go get a master's in clinical psych, all right? Yeah, the basement scares me. Go get some fresh air before kickoff, you know? I'm telling it you, does. man, I need something. I need something. <laughs> this is going to be a long week. I'm not sleeping well. I'm I'm sorry. This is big, man. This well, is you're drinking coffee. Week. It's 830. I might have something to do with it. <laughs> it's water in my Frank Leahy mug. Give me a break. Got it.
It's just water. I don't need coffee. I need anti-coffee. Oh my gosh, this has been amazing. Oh, it's how, how, I mean, how it's, long are we going, gentlemen? It's it's Ohio State, guys. It's uh, it, it's I mean, Notre Dame's got big Michigan games, and you know, game day's been to Michigan like eleven times, I think. Um, Todd Burlidge wrote, I, I I think he posted today some of those numbers. So game days here, it's gonna be an awesome, it's gonna be an awesome environment, and the, the matchups are, I mean, seriously, the matchups are endless. Yeah. Endless on this thing, yep. you know, and dude, these comments are a riot. This is hilarious. This chat has been hilarious the whole time. Like it's just been great, man. You see me dying laughing. I mean, it, it's, it's fantastic. Well, What's cool is a lot of these are crossovers. They watch us both. So they know your guys vibe. And then they're with me in the mornings. And like, I like seeing the crossover. People seem to love it. This is beautiful, man. But this is what, Anybody who loves college football, this, this is it, man. These are the weeks. And it, it's just, it's a beautiful thing. Um, I, I am just, uh, it's a great opportunity for Notre Dame. And and the circumstances are such that I hope they can take advantage of it this time. Uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. And this fan base is ready for something like this. So we're ready, man. This is going to be a great weekend, hopefully. Do we have any any? questions yes. you know like any any meaty questions that we could dig into i got about yeah. another 20 minutes left in me maybe all right cool we got a couple super chats that have been sitting here for about a half hour beef eater said if goolsby was going to pick three man you did oh. just say meaty questions right yeah i did and we got beef eater dropping a super chat you gotta love that if goolsby is going to pick three former teammates to wander around the tailgate with and bust up osu meathead tailgates there's that word meat again uh who does he pick so funny that this uh, again i'm going back to the bite in my tongue thing can you let it rip um, or are you really gonna get yourself no, but it's like these ohio state fans and it's like yeah yeah come see me you know what i'm saying but if we're talking about former teammates to buy myself time um i would take greg Pauley, who's a you know 310 pound uh nose tackle just i've seen him do some stuff where it's just like oh my god um, so I'd take Paulie and then I'd probably take Jared Clark. Like if we were like, yeah, backs to the wall, Jared Clark was a wrestler, just one of those dudes, like, you know, him. And I'm like, I would never want to mess with Jared. I just wouldn't, you know, Zibby. Um, How about well, Zibby, technically, if he gets into a fight, like he's going to jail because he's like a trained fighter. So I'm looking out for Zibby. True. Well, Hey, how about my guy, Derek Landry then? Yeah. Landry. I love short like, arms, Tim. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're fighting. I like the thought being put into this. This is deep, a deep dive. Well, I'm trying I like to it. buy myself some time, but yeah, then I was also going to make, cause I'm going to be on the game uh, pre uh, pre game. John, I got some field passes. I'm like, if I ran out there and tackled that stupid Buckeye mascot, like, can we get a GoFundMe to bail me out? You know, with, Hey, with our I've, I've, you know how that? much stuff I've taken for going after that buck nut idiot and all them guys. And I got the Ohio state people message. I want a buck nut, not welcome in this building. I'm not, don't get me going on this. The last Go. thing I want is a Notre Dame home game and it's all green and NBC, our home TV people are going to zoom in on that idiot and face paint and make him the show at our place. I'm already, I'm already mad about it. And happened yet. OK, I don't want to see it. And when I said that, then the Ohio State people go, oh, you don't know what he does for the community. He's a good guy. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. Do it in your community. Stay out of ours. Fair. Stay Fair. out of ours. I don't want him in the damn building. Next question, Mike. Well, I, John, what else makes you mad, man? I just want to hear you. How yell much again. time you got, Mike? <laughs> How much time you got? Huh? You want to talk about your relationship time, with Brian Kelly? How long you want this stream to go? Oh my gosh, my cheeks hurt from laughing so much, man. Um, uh, ND Nation said, uh, how do we stop uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. in the receiving core? Mike? Um, I, you know, I, I would maybe kick the ball over to Tim, but I'm of the mindset again. Just simplify things on the defensive side of the ball. Leave an extra guy in the box. Let's take away the run first. Harrison's probably going to get his – how good is Benjamin Morrison truly and how good is Cam Hart truly? I think athletically, I think they can stack up. I don't think, you know, I mean, I'm just saying like Cam Hart's on that preseason freakazoid list or whatever, like kid can run kids long. 
you got two dudes. So I'm of the mindset, let's take away the run and let's force this young kid to complete these deep balls personally. And um, I, I just, I, I love to have that luxury of that. Maybe they don't need extra help. You know, I like Xavier Watts more in the box. I said this preseason, let Ramon Henderson play center field. Do not ask him to come down and make open field tackles. That's not his thing. It's not a knock. Just let him play center field and let Xavier go down there and get his nose dirty. But I, I feel pretty confidently, and that may change, but I think we can let those corners go one-on-one at least early. Why not? Yeah, my first, yeah, my first thought on, on a, you know, covering Marvin is um, you, I, I went right back to 2019 with, with Hamilton, always over the top of Michael Pittman at USC. They played a box and one on him, always had a guy over the top of Pittman. They're like, you're not catching anything deep. And then everyone else just played man, you know, but they gave up runs. That was what Marquis Stepp, the ex Notre Dame commit guy, right at SC. Uh, he had, the, he had the nice night. Buckeyes running backs are night and day compared to him. So that's the scary thing. That's one thought. And then you just play man and, you know, you're just like, okay, throw to Stover, you know, force it to the, you know, the ex linebacker playing tight end, make him beat you if he can. Fleming is their other slot. But Fleming doesn't like – I thought he was going to be a lot faster. He's a big, thick slot is what he is. He's like a Jaden Thomas type player. So Notre Dame could match him up and put him one-on-one. But uh, I'm scared. Hey, Mike Goolsby, I am – but I started thinking about because Notre Dame lives in nickel. And Ohio State's number one football players outside zone, man. They just build a five guys, big asses. They're all 325, and they zone block like crazy on outside zone. You know, so I'm like, well, how the hell are you going to stop this thing with six guys in the box because they're living in too high? So, which goes back to Watts has to, I mean, they got to insert him like a mad dog against the run. And your point, Henderson's not good. I'll be very nice. Not good inside the box when he's trying to make a tackle. Keep his butt deep as could be. Sounds like we're both worried about Ohio State's run. Just run just the matchup because Notre Dame lives in nickel. They yeah. live in nickel. So that means you only got six in the box. Well, they got six blockers, and you got to go fit up and go tackle that running back, which means they got to, they're, they're going to end up playing a ton of man free or some combination of that. Going back to your point, Goolsby, of Hart and Morrison, you're on these dudes, play. You want to mm-hmm. get drafted, you want to make money, play. Go get their asses, and I think that's what the story is going to be on the on the outside perimeter. And I think, and I, John, you know this. I, I I believe that you feel the same way. I think Morris is up. Morrison's up for the challenge. I just think with his DNA, I just think he's licking his chops. My question comes down to Cam Hart, fifth year senior. John, that whole leadership piece we talked about two and a half hours ago. Yeah. I mean, there's an element to that here. Yeah, like yeah. Cam. Please um, go make a play. Yeah. And the thing with Morrison is, do you guys get the vibe? I feel like he's got that, that uh, oh, yeah. secondary player gene of like the bigger the moment, the better the matchup, the more high profile that guy is. I think the more he gets in that zone of like, I'm going to go wreck this game and do what I need to do. Um, and, and so it, it's just good to see guys up for that challenge. Uh, sometimes I think, the mentality of Notre Dame's guys back there, sometimes it doesn't feel to me the way it does some other places as far as wanting to just kill people and be that dude and have that gene. And and I want to be the man and all that. And I think Morrison has it. You're going to need it. Those guys, get an arm and get in, get a hand in a way. Tip a ball up that we catch. Like, who's going to make the play? Like, you're going to have to make some plays with that defense. You're not going to, you can't just let, Ohio State, with all that talent, just keep getting drives. Somebody's going to have to step up and make a big play. I don't know who it's going to be, but it better be a couple guys. John, you're right about the previous like previous secondaries. You're like, yeah, you don't feel that level of confidence come through your screen in the way that you do with Morrison. Yeah. The reason being, bro, because we didn't have the athletes. Yeah, because they weren't as good I mean, as imagine you. Being good that, imagine being that three-star that's corner going reason. up against – Yeah, we did, they, they, they know yeah. they're beat. It's like going – I mean, yeah. that's why some people lost to Tyson. They know they're going to get knocked out walking in the ring. Yeah. It was the same thing. So now Morrison wants to show you how talented he is. He's yeah. looking forward to that stage. Hart to me, in terms of his energy, his, uh, you know, his flow or whatever, I think Hart – presents as i'm better like he thinks he's better than he is you know and like he just never seems to just ratchet it up that extra 20 percent. 
and I'm bagging him. This is the game to go make a play. Yeah. Yeah, man. There, there's just so many nuances here and so many questions everybody has about each of these teams and all of these matchups. And I don't know if we're going to get all the answers, but we're definitely going to learn a lot about both of these teams. And, and another thing is too, here's the, I was trying to think of this before I came on, on the downside, should things go bad for Notre Dame or they don't pull this off? Um, and there isn't a lot of positives there, but here's one of them. At least if that happened, it's going to give Notre Dame a clear indicator of where they need to get better. Okay. And if things go wrong, you're at least going to know, okay, here's an area we played this elite roster and we learn we got to get better here, or deeper here, develop there. Like it's going to be a true litmus test against a star laden team. And I'm excited to see where Notre Dame falls in that. Um, I think this team has just, they're a little bit different upstairs. I see a little bit more leadership. I see a little bit more attitude, not like unwarranted swag, but just a little more confidence in how they carry themselves. There's these little indicators that just tell me I like the vibe. I like the vibe. Hmm. I feel it's like, good. um, just to, I'm just kidding. Um, I like this comment from, from a good luck Chuck. Um, but seriously, I do feel like one thing, is talking about turnovers for Notre Dame to go make a play is that Notre Dame needs to take care of the ball. We can't have any SMA fumbles. Oh, yeah. Hartman, dude, if you get hit, you got to you got to hold on to that ball. Notre Dame there, there, there's a reason none of us have mentioned that because obviously, like you, I wouldn't even going to mention that part because obviously, I don't think you want to be given that offense with that talent any extra. And he, he Hartman has no interceptions. This ain't the time to put one on the ledger. Well, that's going back to, I think we started to talk about that earlier. Hartman, you know, with, at weight, chucking it up deep. A lot of his picks were yep. deep, deep down the middle, yep. trying to attack, trying to make something happen. Yeah. He, had Hartman, he had to do everything. He had to do everything. Yeah. Exactly. It's a totally no, different to setup. He didn't have that kind of support there. Even the line yeah. and all that, and no run game. He had to do everything. So then you are throwing balls that are going to get, it's a different ball game now. Well, well I'll say that's, that's, very disciplined of Hartman not to go back to some of his instincts at times. Cause there are times when I'm watching, you know, doing the rewatch, you see him what he wants to look, he looks deep a lot yeah. and he almost takes a side boom, dink it to a back. He throws to the backs like all the time. So mm -hmm. he's always yeah. checking. He wants to throw deep. He is looking, which goes back to some of our concerns about this team is does he trust those guys? You know, the, yeah. The best thing Sam Hartman did at, at Wake Forest, we haven't seen one play of it this year going back to a wrinkle, back shoulder fades. He threw back shoulder fades night and day, especially in the red zone at Wake. Haven't seen one. Is that because the outside guys are just not good at catching them? And, That's what I was going to ask. Who would you want to be that guy if you were going to go to that for Notre Dame, if you were going to throw that? And is that why they're shying away from it? Because you know he could throw that ball. Is it the other end of that equation that has them hesitant? Hey, John. Yeah. What do you think about Brian Kelly? Hey, huh. real quick, let's answer John's question. Yeah. Who's going to catch that jump ball? In the same way we're talking about these DBs, our DBs going out and competing, flip it over. Our wide receivers have got to go compete for a ball. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. Jaden Thomas is probably that guy. I mean, I'm, we're talking about athletically on paper, it ought to be Tobias. Tobias is still a run underneath it guy versus yeah. putting his foot in the ground and going up. But I think Jaden Thomas, just with his build – you know, the he's an older player. He understands. Beefy, man. He looks beefy running around out there, don't he? He looks like he's built like a brick oh, Jack, upstairs dude. kind of. I mean, he's a beefy dude. I like it. And then again, everybody's beefy compared him. to me. But he literally looks like a rectangle. Out. He's beefy. I like John, him. They use him as a, we'll run that counter play. He's the third blocker. He wraps like a like a pulling guard. He's a yeah. pulling guard. Exactly. He's, he's, he's the second tight end when they've been doing that super counter, as I call it, when I chart it. It's like, boom, he's the third guy. Pulling up, trying to find Mike Backers for crying out loud. So, Get but Larry you know, Fitzgerald vibes from Jaden Thomas when that blocking, I love it. Okay, but but all right. So that's Larry Fitzgerald. Did Larry Fitzgerald pull and block Mike Backers, which means can Thomas catch the twenty? You know that the the twenty yard deep out route that needs to be done against Burke and and these studs that they got on the perimeter. They, these dudes are fast as could be. So. The back, maybe maybe they've been holding up. Going back to John's point, what have they been holding back on? Maybe it is the back shoulder fade. Maybe this is the game to do it because they're going to get – they play Porter's man. They're going to line up and say, I got you, I got you. They have zero, 
zero fear of Notre Dame, I believe, of their offensive personnel matching up against them. We're not running by, yeah, Tim, we're not running by anybody. No, yeah. no, well, no, then, no. But then that, that makes me want to ask, is it important that Notre Dame at least tries to maybe – go that route and and take a couple of those shots just to show Iowa State they're willing to do it? Like, is that something that's in play just to show we're not afraid to do this to try and at least have it in their head well, that they can't it. just forget about everything on the back end and, and creep up on us? No, no, I'll say they do it. They did it last year with, with, with Tyler Buckner. I mean, Tyler Buckner threw, what, five deep, deep balls. I'm talking 40 yards down the field. So they will definitely try it. They did it last year and in this game. So they're – they're going to have to because of the, the structure of their defense. They sell out. Yeah. I mean, Jim Knowles and these guys, he's he's going to sell out. Like I said, I mentioned Sonny Styles is a nickel. He's really – he's just a dude to lay him anywhere on the field. They will sell out. They'll sit their safeties at eight yards and just be like, beat us over the top. And they'll play those two corners on, on the outside. Play them off. It looks zoney-ish. No, they're running. They're just turning and running with guys. So Notre Dame is going to have to try it deep. That goes back to Hartman, his accuracy that he had at Wake. He's going to have to nail some of those, go back to that Clemson game last year and bring his inner Clemson from last year and try and beat these guys over the top if he can. All right. That was the longest we've been silent for the entire stream. Goolsby, you got to sign us off? Well, sign yourself off. Is there any more more super chats? I was going to jump off at nine. Yeah, 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 we're caught up. All right. I'm signing off, gentlemen. I think we Goolsby. covered a lot of ground. We have, yeah. Goolsby we score prediction. What I say the other day, I, I, I don't I say, remember. I think I said twenty-eight, twenty-four. Okay, Notre Dame. I just again, I I see it being a fist fight. I see it, John. It comes down to four, five, six plays being made. Yep. Um, that's just, that's just how I I see it going. Tr- truly. Um, the lack of turnovers from Sam concerns me. It's like you wish you would have got one out of his system because we haven't responded to some of that. Don't if I do that. Does don't, fumble, don't hey, jump let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Don't even jump start that into the ether. Don't do it. We're on a if zero, and we're just going to keep on going with zero. There is no mean regression. We're not doing that. It's a zero, know. and we're keeping it zero, Mikey. Just my thoughts. It's just my thoughts. And if estimate does happen to cough the ball up, we're not taking him out of the game, Tim. I swear, no. you know, yeah. we're not going to. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't need to go uh, oh, think about it. You one more thing. It. I'm not letting this end without putting this out there. I've been having this vision in my Notre Dame brain this week. Something tells me at some point our big hooked kicker that could kick it about 60 oh, yeah. yards might come into play in this one. I don't know why I'm having these Irish visions of him kicking like a 58 yard or something. And there could be no points spared in this one. So, that's a big part of it too, and and okay. I hope I, it's a long boot. I just hope it's straight. Hey, uh, real quick before uh, Goolsby leaves. So, Mike, what's the agenda? You're saying you're going to be on the field for a pregame? You meeting up any old players? Um, I gotta like, I'm the worst, you know, in terms of preparation. So, yeah, I think there's going to be some ex players. I, I talked to Zorch offline. There's some stuff going on. You know, I'll be there with some ex, you know, just Notre Dame student ex, you know, buddies of mine. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think I plan on doing something, filming something, you know, as close to, because dude, right before kickoff, they run you off that field. Um, and I, I mean, they take, those ushers take their job very seriously. I had a dip in last year and the guy was like, if I didn't know who you are, I'd kick you out. I'm like, all right, dude, relax, you know. But uh, so they, I'm going to try and film something as close to kickoff as possible. And then maybe even like a halftime update i'm gonna film something and send it to you singer and you go nuts with it i mean all right you know that's why they pay you the big bucks but yeah i'm gonna be there uh where are you sitting where's your seats i love shocker tim okay i like to be in an end zone because it's like playing linebacker right you get it it's like a tight copy so i'm in the don't ask me what direction i'm no good with directions but i'm facing this this the big screen Nice. And the the left, if I if you're coming out of the tunnel, I'm to the left. It's good. They're good seats. They're expensive enough. Thanks, Hartman. By the way, I love that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks to Hartman. Yes. Now we know basically why it's virtually where I sat last year for Clemson. More or less, you know. Same. I don't. You know. Again, John, you have the sections memorized and all this. I'm to the left of the tunnel, looking at the the big screen. Hey, you know what seats? You know what seats I started getting on purpose. 
Very, very, very top row of the upper deck on an aisle. It's perfect for a guy like me. I can stand the whole game and no one's behind me or kneeing me or telling me to sit Fair. down. And I'm on an aisle, so I got a little extra pacing room. And then when things go bad or it's a nine-minute TV timeout, I could turn around and just look at nature out in South Bend. I love it. Top row, upper deck. You can see everything. It's beautiful. Stand you the whole game. John, you run hot and hot. you just be careful up there. You run hot and cold. Don't ever jump off, you know, depending on how bad it goes. You know, know what you happened, Mike? When I was up there last week in that end zone and I saw Hartman's leg bend backwards, my body <laughs> convulsed. I almost flipped off this backwards and ended it all. I didn't mean to do it. I saw that leg yeah. and my body convulsed. I almost flipped over and there'd be no more always Irish before this game. I, I didn't it. mean it. I just convulsed. I could, yeah, you'd be cursing all the way to the ground. You know, I could It'd be it. the last curse words I get out, but I, man, I saw it's the one thing you couldn't have last week is that guy's leg twisting sideways. Well, Gave talk me to Rocco. Talk, talk, talk to Rocco. Last thought, last thought. You mentioned something, John. People telling you to sit down. Folks, if you're going to the game, if you know somebody going to the game, no, you know. No, we all paid great money to be here. No, and let's uh, let's let's watch the game no. according. Go to a play if you want entertainment. You want to sit and be quiet for three hours. Go to a play. Don't come to this game. Amen. I don't care how much you donate. I don't care how much money you make. If you just want entertainment, you want to sit on your butt for three hours. Go to a movie. Go to a play. Leave this for other people because it ain't for you. And Amen. I don't care how much Notre Dame money you have and you donate. I don't care. This is not a play. Nobody should be sitting all night. That's my final speech. Gentlemen. It's game day. Play. Exactly. John and Mike. Thank Go you guys it. so much. That was amazing. I will always remember this night. The, the, the crossover. That was amazing. This was uh, this was good, and uh, it it's a it's just a special week. So I knew this would be fun. It exceeded all of my expectations. It did me. It did me as well, John. We've been talking about this, and I've popped on your show a few times. But this, yeah, having you on here it, was. You know what it is, you guys? It's all for the people, and all the people seem to like it. It's all about the people. Hey, John, give Singer your number. I want your number. Got you. Will do. Oh, I've been all texting right. with John. Yeah. For or you, you know what else? I'll d I'll DM it to you on Twitter, maybe. There you go. All right. Yeah, either All way. Right. Either All way. right. Thanks, cool. John, you John, you're a legend. Have a good one, man. It, it was really nice joining you guys. And uh, this is just, it's a special opportunity. And it's just great to join you for it. This is going to be a great weekend. Love All right, it. John. Thanks Love again. It. Can't wait to talk. That was okay. Awesome. awesome. You guys oh. don't go anywhere. We're not done. Ghoul, or Tim, are you okay? Can you hang for a little bit more? I'm old, but I'll, uh, I mean, what do you what do you got next? We just went three hours, baby. What do you got? We're not even done. Okay, so I sent out the outline, or actually, I don't think I sent it out to everyone. Mike, like that outline went out about uh, an hour and a half ago. <laughs> yeah, I know. At nine o'clock, I was supposed to have these next two guys on. Nine o'clock. It's nine fifty-seven Eastern. Get them on. Let's talk some atmosphere. Let's get these let's get these South Bend guys on here and get hyped up. So let's get our South Bend guys on. Yeah. Uh, Tyler Horka. Um uh, my, no my good buddy. Tonight, right, Tyler. Are we okay? It's not hot. Ho hockey goes like 10 months a year, by the way. It's like as soon as this cup ends, they're right back. I saw the Bruins were on TV earlier naming captains. I'm like, hockey season already? What the heck? September. Yeah. So, never ends. I know if I if I had a free moment, I would go up to Traverse City, Michigan, because that's where the Stars do their training camp deal. Oh, but okay. weekends like this uh, or weeks like this, not, not a free moment. I'll be lucky to get some sleep tonight, like John was saying. Can't sleep. <laughs> that, guy's a, that guy's a riot, man. That was incredible. Oh, he, he's fantastic. Um, yeah, great. So I don't know if you guys saw on Twitter the other day. We all kind of tweeted out blue and gold. Um, so far in the month of September, we're number three in the network and page views. We're pretty excited about that. A lot of that's due to Tyler Horka and then our newest addition to the blue and gold staff. Jack Sobel has been absolutely fantastic. Um, someone on the message board the other day was like, man, just, just patting us on the back, man. The staff's so great. They're like, Mike, you're really doing a great job with these guys. I'm thinking to myself, I don't do a damn thing. I Tyler and Jack just do their own thing. I mean, I work with, with Kyle on recruiting, but Tyler and Jack, I mean, these guys are, are seriously are just fantastic. So all their Twitter handles are on the screen. So please follow them. 
um, on uh, on social media uh, or excuse me on Twitter if you've not done so yet. So, um, Tyler, I want to talk to you about and Jack, of course, the atmosphere this week in South Bend. Talk throw it to you first. Like, what are you kind of expecting this week? And then I am going to go to the bathroom real quick because <laughs> I've been sitting for a long time. Yeah, I know. I, I I was at the gym like two hours ago watching this on my phone and here I am two hours later and Tim's still in the same spot. Singer needs to go use the restroom. It's incredible. Uh, yeah, the atmosphere, I was just thinking, I've been covering college football for probably, well, since 2016, I was a junior at University of Texas and I've been going to college football games every single year or every like every single week for the last nine years. This is the 10th year. I don't think I've ever been as hyped up from really Saturday to Saturday for a college football game as I have been for this one, just because like we were on the field for the central Michigan game at the very end clock hit triple zeros, 41, 17. I turned to the guy next to me and I was just like, it's here. Like this is, this is Ohio state week. Cause Ireland was cool. That was awesome. But that was all ambiance. And then obviously Tennessee state, NC state, central Michigan, but this is like Ohio state, Notre Dame. It's only happened in South Bend three times uh jack and i were at the linebacker lounge uh a week ago friday and nobody was talking about central michigan everyone was already talking about ohio state so like i know tim's been talking about ohio state for eight months uh, notre dame fans have like really once fall camp rolled around it was it was fair game to start talking ohio state because like yeah maybe nc state could have tripped notre dame up a little bit didn't happen notre dame ends up winning that game by 21 points and then, like, as soon as that happened, everybody knew, okay, it's Ohio State. Like, this is the make-or-break game for the season. And you can kind of feel that here. Like I said, I've been going to college football games every single year for, like, the last 10 years. Have not felt this build-up, this lead-up into a game um, ever. And the, really the only other time, ironically, was uh, the game ended up not meaning anything. 2016, Notre Dame was going down to Texas. It ended up being that double overtime game. Like as a student there, and you could see Notre Dame fans rolling into campus like Thursday. That's why I want to go ch check out campus tomorrow if I have a, a minute or just like walk around there. I expect to see some Ohio State fans. It's that kind of feeling this week because you got two blue bloods of the sport meeting and, and like the eyes of the college football world are going to be on South Bend Saturday night. There's, there's really no other way to put it. I got that. Look Tim, I got to jump in real quick. Uh, Go Irish asked, will there be a post game show? Oh, hell yes, there's going to yes. be a post game show. Me yes. and Tim will be on there. Uh, and then we had the super chat from uh, MJH Irish84 said, I remember it used to be just the Friday preview for the upcoming game on Saturday. Now I'm a basket case for six days prior to the next game because of all the online and YouTube chats. It's very stressful. Love it. I'll take that as a big compliment. Um, yeah, it used to be a pretty bare bones operation where it'd be like a Friday preview show, maybe a recruiting update during the week. And then the, the post game show, that was it. Yeah. Uh, that was the 2020 season. And then, uh, yeah, we're a full blown operation. Now Hork has got his own show with Darren Pritchett. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's fantastic. So make sure you guys check that out Monday, uh, 3 PM Eastern time. So I uh, really appreciate that super chat. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I, I just got a, a quick question for the fellas since they're there. It's, you know, going back to, you know, John, who was on with us and the atmosphere, that's me is just Notre Dame fan, all these things. I've seen so many big games. It's like when you left the press conference, could you feel it with the dudes? You know, I'm, you know, I'm talking about the reporters, the chat, and obviously you had the players. Who was it? Cam Hart, JD Bertrand yesterday. Um, speaking of the Thursday, uh, Joe Alt, like I mentioned earlier, is on it with Andy Staples of on three on his podcast today and joe was like you start to see more guys coming into town more things coming in he, and he was like thursday it's going to pick up big time so you guys starting to get that feel when you've been on the campus and obviously chat with the players yesterday yeah i haven't really been on campus much i've kind of been locked like lock, locking myself in here writing but i, I de like 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 Horker said i definitely want to get out there to tomorrow or friday but i mean de de there's definitely there's definitely a buzz like like, like tyler said like I don't know if I've ever covered a game where just the instant after the final buzzer sounds, everyone is already, you know, talking about the next game. It's like, all right, we, we, we ate our vegetables for the first four games of the season. Like this, this is I like, not, not that, not that it wasn't entertaining and, and, and fun to cover. I mean, I mean, it, I mean, it was like Notre, uh, Notre Dame looked, looked terrific the vast majority of time in the four, in the four games, but this is really the first time. And by the way, this goes for Ohio state too. You look at their schedule up until this point, like, 
this is the first time we'll actually really learn something uh, and get a good test of how far these teams could go in this game. Uh, Player-wise, the, the players are not hyping this game up, at least publicly whatsoever. Uh, they're very much sticking to, uh, like, the, the closest they came to, to doing that was Hartman saying, like, it's it's a big game. We'd be foolish not to look at it that way. But they're they're steadfast and, you know, we are preparing like it's any other game. We're going to do our thing. We're going to execute yeah, all, all that good stuff. I, I have so, a say, uh, Go ahead, Tyler. Can I say quick. something to, to yeah. that real quick, Mike? Yeah, yeah. And this kind of goes off of what Tim was saying too. Was like the people who are here and around it, and like we're covering Notre Dame. The players are playing for Notre Dame. The coach is coaching for Notre Dame. Here's from my uh, perspective: if you slip yourself into my shoes, since Sunday, the only thing that I can think like I wake up every morning and I'm like, Notre Dame's playing Ohio State this week. Notre Dame's playing Ohio State this week. Like Jack said, we're holding here. We're writing. We're writing about Notre Dame playing Ohio State this week. If me, just the writer for Blue and Gold Illustrated, sitting here thinking about that game every single waking moment, and John was just on here probably some some moments while he's like sleeping and he wakes up and then he's thinking about it again. He's he's dreaming about it. If that's what I'm thinking, I can only imagine what these players are thinking. They're they're probably like, this is it, man. This is not Navy. This is not Tennessee State. This is Ohio State. And like that's what it's all about. And, and then to to the Point that we were all just making i saw a tweet um i forget who it was brian freemu am i saying that right uh he's like an analytics guy yeah, yeah, around notre dame yeah yeah he's really that's guy he, he took a photo from uh like that balcony part of notre dame stadium where you can see touchdown jesus you can see the lawn it's on twitter as of like a, two hours ago maybe um and game day set up like the bare bones is starting to go up they're starting to put the stuff up tomorrow is when they're going to really like build the set, build the stage. It's going to be ready by Friday when students and the players and the coaches see that it's going to be like, Holy crap, we've got 48 hours until this thing. And I, and like I said, we've already been thinking about it, feeling it as soon as tomorrow hits, it's going to be the, it, it's game for me. Game weekend start on like Thursday. It's like a 48 hour affair. And this 48 hour affair is going to be um, one with magnitude. Like, like we haven't seen in a long time. Like you guys started the show off three hours ago tim said it's like the biggest game in the last three decades it's true it's like completely true i do have some of the feeling where i'm like i'm nervous for this game how like just what you said tyler like how do they feel i just hope just you get hit and all that's gone you're just playing football and that that's that's the kind of hope it goes um, away for sure but it's like you got to deal with it for seven days yeah. and, and maybe some people even longer than that tim's been dealing with it for eight months uh, actually, since I met Tim three years ago, yeah, because um, you know, I knew because I knew Notre Dame would be four zero, and I didn't, and I didn't, you know, people are like, well, you got Marshall, you always, it's like, no, I, this, this was going to be a different team, and it completely is. It's just last year was last year, mistakes were made, whatever, it's done. It's a completely different team, and that's why I was like, no, nah, man, I told this to Mike six months ago. It's like it's gonna be a top ten battle. Both teams will be in the top ten come this game, and here it is, man. Let's get so after and. It. Our video uh, post Marcus Freeman presser on Monday that Jack and I did, which has like twenty something thousand views, that video just popped off. Um, I asked, I made the comment to Jack, and we talked about it. So I'll, I'll throw this to Jack first. But like, in all my years covering Notre Dame, never have they done the quarterback talking after the head coach press conference. Yeah. So I want to hear from Tyler and Tim on that, but I want to go to Jack first. Like, because you kind of said this is what the NFL guys do. And that's basically how they view Sam Hartman. He's the face of the program for this year. You're 24 years old, right? You're the same age as some of these coaches. Kidding, but not really. Um, and, yeah, that's kind of how they view him, Jack. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you, I think you hit the nail on the head. It, it's it's like NFL teams treat their quarterbacks. And, and really just their quarterbacks. I don't think any – like, you, you obviously have stars at other positions in the NFL. No one else really just – has a scheduled press conference every week. If your team has a if your team has a franchise quarterback, they're going to be talking to reporters every week. And Hartman doesn't Hartman obviously doesn't do that, but uh, he's talked after all but two of the game. He's talked after two of the games. Got a midweek last week, and then Monday this week he's talked four to, he's talked four times since the regular season began. Uh, and you know he, he's he's proven he can he can handle it. Like he. He's extremely media savvy. He gets the message. He, he gets exactly what message they, they want out there. They trust him completely. I, 
you know, you, you, a lot, a lot of coaches, like, you know, you, you say you trust your players and then you're super, super controlling. You, you never bring the, bring the stars out, out to the media. You never, never bring, you know, who, who the, who the fans want to hear from. I, uh, with, with Sam Hartman, it's just the complete, complete trust in him. He is the guy they, they want, they want his face on, on, on everything and every photo, everything around this program. I, uh, and I mean, that, that's a, that's a big reason just that they have that guy right now. Uh, like when, when was the last time Notre Dame had a guy who was the face of the program like that? I, uh, and it, it, particularly at the quarterback position uh, in, in a year that's going so, so well, so far, it, it just, it just feels di- like I, this is my first year, first year on the beat, but I, I've been a college football fan for a while. I, I, I follow college football for a while. I, I can't remember thinking of a Notre Dame team like I think about, like I think about this one, I, in recent memory, that that's just it. it it's different. Nick Singer, I was gonna say. Speaking of Hartman uh, being the face of everything, isn't he on a shirt this week that just came out in the last twenty four hours? Mm-hmm. For crying out loud! So yeah, yeah, he's all over. That was funny you bring that up, Mike. I thought the same thing because you know I I listen to all of Freeman's press conferences. I love listening to him, and I always jump on the message board and read you know, when Tyler's breaking everything down and just to check it out before I go listen, get a little insight. And then I was like, holy moly, Sam Hartman speaking. It's big game. My, my first thing is, is big game week. They're putting Hartman out there. They keep with this, this right here from a you know, home field right there. It's like, boom, get, get this thing rolling. They're putting out their face of their football program for 2023. And um, I thought it was smart. I, lo- I loved it. I love that he was out there representing Notre Dame for this week. Use promo code BLUEGOLD23 for 15% off your first order. And if this is your first order, the same Hartman um, T-shirt, it's going to be a pretty good one. So, uh, yeah, Horka, thoughts on this? Yeah, I was actually – Tom DeMay there, his comment, he stole the words out of my mouth. Um, the last time Notre Dame had a Sam Hartman-like character or whatever you want to call him on the team, it was probably Manti Teo in 2012 – there, there was a lot of other things going on with Manti, obviously, but just in terms of like larger than life charisma, it was him. And you can only do so much with that at linebacker. Like Manti parlayed it into a trip to New York City for the Heisman Trophy ceremony, which is incredible. Just shows you the season that he had. But this is the quarterback at, at Notre Dame. And like I'm a little bit older than Jack, so I, I've seen a little bit more Notre Dame football and like I, I remember the Brady Quinn days, for example, and I don't think our, our esteemed colleague Jack would remember the, the Brady Quinn I, days I because, do not know. okay, that's how young he was at the time. I do. And like that was cool because it was like, holy cow, no, Notre Dame actually has one of the best quarterbacks in the country right now. And then Jimmy Clausen was supposed to be that. You could say what you want about like who was around him. That was probably a big part of why he wasn't, but he was talented, and, but he was never that. And then for the last 10 years, like the closest that Notre Dame got to that was what Ian book. Like, I mean, no, no slight to Ian book dude was a gamer dude, won 30 college football games for the university of Notre Dame. But now Notre Dame has this dude that like you could be in Tuscaloosa, Alabama or Austin, Texas or Clemson, South Carolina. And people know who Sam Hartman is like, that's a big deal. Uh, a lot of people are going to know who Sam Hartman is. If he finds a way to win this football game, he's playing well enough to, to have his Heisman moment. So um, yeah. And and just to get back to the question about like running him out Monday after Freeman, that was made public knowledge to the media on Saturday night after the game. Like they told us in the post game press conference, Oh, by the way, you're going to get Sam Hartman after Marcus Freeman on Monday in the press conference setting. So that's when I was like, that's to my, that's my point of, yeah, seven days in advance, Ohio State week has already started. They're already saying, yeah, you're going to get the quarterback on Monday. Why do you think they're doing that, Tyler? Like, why do you think they're really leaning into it? Because if anything, it just puts more pressure on the guy. That's why I don't think we've seen – like, Jack – I don't know if there's an example, actually, of a, Drew Pine I think we got pretty much after every single game last week because they weren't afraid of what he was going to say, and, and he wasn't a larger-than-life thing. It was – Notre Dame was often winning in spite of Drew Pine. Now they're winning because of him or now they're winning because of Sam Hartman, that would put pressure on the guy. But if I'm Notre Dame, it might be a Sam Hartman thing where they're saying, hey, just tell us if you don't want to go out to the media after this game, we won't do that. But if I was Notre Dame, I'd be like, dude, you're going after every game because you can literally say no wrong right now on the football field. You can do no wrong. We need to like, we only got what you got you for one year. This is a rental. 
Like this is like making a trade if you're in the NFL or the NBA or the NHL in February and saying we are going to bleed everything we can out of this guy for a couple months because this is all that we got him for. Right now, he's like, like I said, he can do no wrong. I would put him out. If, if they beat Ohio State on Saturday, he's got to talk after every single game for the rest of the year because his – I don't – was it Mike Hughes that said it? Was it Tim? Like, like if I think it might have been Tim. And, and, Mike, I know that you had the, the bold prediction at the start of the year, but – if he wins on Saturday, there's like basically no scenario that he does not end up and he keeps playing the same way in New York. Like, no, I mean, you're right. I mean, I've said, you know, if he, they, they win Saturday, because I don't think Notre Dame's going to go nine and three after you beat Ohio State, they're going to continue this ride somehow, some way to where you beat Ohio State, you're the face of Notre Dame. Great point, Tyler, about just put him out there and you're basically just, you're, hey, you're here for a couple months. We're going to use the living hell out of you. That's what they're doing. You're going out there. You're the face. You're selling T-shirts now. You're selling beats. You're all over the place. Branding, all that thing. And I also think, as Mike has, has talked about, the well-oiled machine, the recruiting department, they're like, your butt's out there, the face of this, for recruiting as well, just to show what Notre Dame can do once you're in the spotlight, so to speak, at Notre Dame. One second, and I want to throw it to Jack because I think Jack had something to say. Um, not only for recruiting, but I – and I've said this. this It's even more specifically, at least in my opinion, what they're doing is to show future transfer portal quarterbacks. Look what we did with Sam Hartman. Not only improving his draft stock potentially, but look at his brand, the things that he did here. I think it, it could make Notre Dame the quarterback transfer portal destination. Can't you sell that to any quarterback, though? Like, can't you sell that to Deuce Knight? Be like, hey, I, I know you're, that you haven't started 45 games before you got here, but we could get you to this. Just feel yeah, for thought. Yeah, Just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jack, do you have thoughts? Yeah, no, to, to, the, to the point of uh, kind of kind of getting his brand out there, like I, Ty, Ty was at the, Ty was at the uh, NC State game. I watched that on TV. I think game day talked about him for like a combined like 20 to 30 minutes. I mean, they, they, had, they had a feature on, on his rib necklace, which I continue to maintain is awesome. They they had they they talked to him they talked to him on the field I uh, they talked about him nonstop I you know when 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 the five of them were were, were just talking like he's he's a, such a hot topic and be, beyond beyond all the face of the program stuff and and the hype and and the branding and, and all 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 that it's important to remember I think Ty Ty touched on it like he's playing ridiculously well even for how high how, even for how high the expectations were. Like you can, Notre Dame can get the ball, and you have full confidence that 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 they're going to score. And that that sounds so rudimentary, but it, it's a luxury that so few teams have, and it has ev everything to do with with the quarterback with the quarterback who's there. And he also takes the pressure off a running back who would get my vote for the Doak Walker right now. Uh, running backs don't really win Heisman trophies anymore, but in a world in which they do. Audric Estime has a case for like Heisman right now, but your quarterback's playing so well. It's like, okay, yeah, let Sam Hartman be Sam Hartman. Audric Estime can be Audric Estime almost like if it's possible in the shadows. And he's probably one of the best running backs in America right now. And, and vice versa, by the way, because like the, that's the thing about Notre Dame right now. They're such a balanced offense. They, they can beat, they can beat a team. However they want to, they want to beat a team. Like you, you have a team, like Ohio State, who I think I uh, we haven't really seen in the first three games. Uh, but you go back to towards the end of last season, they they've been vulnerable against a against a run game like Michigan's. Like you want to run, you want to run power and counter uh, and duo down down Ohio State's throat. Like you can do that with the personnel you have. But then if Ohio State adjusts and, and loads the box, like you can you can gun Sam Hartman down to Tyree and Merriweather and and Thomas. And like that's such a luxury that so few teams have right now. All right, hot take from Mike Singer real quick. The rib thing also weirded me out. Not that I think it's, like, bad or, like, why. I, I, I'm just, like, eh, I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm squeamish. I'm a squeamish person. And just to think about it, it, it weirds me out. Um, I forgot all about that. I actually just, I just found it real quick. So I'm going to watch it tonight when I get home to check out that little ESPN thing. I need to watch it, too. I've only read about it. But uh, when I just think about it, I get squeamish. Okay. Man, the 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 group with 
with I mean, really, Tim, we were bystanders for the most of it, but Ghouls being John going back and forth was amazing. And you know, I'm I'm sitting here laughing the entire time reading the chat, and you know, I'm just I'm like, I'm I can't talk on here, I might as well talk in the chat. Um, but there's one thing I really wanted to chime in on is truck or trailer. We love that term, Tim. And for for Tyler and Jag, maybe we haven't talked about it on the show. It's are you a truck? And it's specifically at the quarterback position. Are you pulling guys along with you? Sam Hartman's a truck, yes. The or truck are you a question. trailer <laughs> and you need to be pulled along, right? That's something Sam, we've talked Sam about. Sam Hartman has all the horsepower in the world. He's pulling the thing. Like, he's a truck. And he know, has to be. He has to be on Saturday. Because I fully expect Ohio State to come after Sam and Audric Estime. They're, they're going to come after the quarterback. And when they stack the box – they're going to try to stop the run game, obviously, too. And, and they're going to say Notre Dame receivers beat us. Audric has to be a truck because we often don't talk about running backs and trucks. Audric SMA, you cannot put the ball on the ground, first of all, and you have to shed tackles. Like, if you get hit at the line against a linebacker that's your size, we might just – like, we need you to break the tackle – I think, and Goolsby really hit on this. Like, we're all going to talk about Hartman, Hartman, Hartman. Estime is just as important to me to just make a play, dude. Like, you need to break that tackle. And John kind of gave me crap about, yeah, no crap, they can't turn the ball over. But seriously, no, like, we're not talking about it, but what, did, what has Audrey Estime done? He's fumbled. And to, to shout out the great movie, The Program, I hope Estime is just carrying that ball around all week in his <laughs> arm, tucked away. Because no no turnovers. I I think they did that with them last year, didn't they? They did that. Did they do that with them last? I should know. I'm the I'm the one that's here reporting on all these things. But I think he actually carried a football around after the Stanford game or something. Yeah. Yeah. So no, but you're right. You're right, Mike. Estimate. That's why I don't think the five headed, the four headed, the three headed monster. You know, if we see love, it's going to be for I I think a special play. I think it's going to be for something Mm. like that. If Price comes in, it may just be the rest estimate i fully expect audrick to get 25 plus carries yeah. i mean he had 20 against central michigan for crying out loud he's got a career high wouldn't it yeah i, I think think it was it was career high. high. It was 18 I think you're right. Before, right so he's gonna get 25 he's he's kind of got rested maybe that's why they kept him in in some of that fourth quarter just to get his wind up and say dude you're getting 20 today just to see how you feel at the end and no no they're gonna write him they're gonna write him because the play action game with hartman is gonna it's going to have to be lethal. I did watch the program. I watched it the day a day or two after those guys gave me such a hard time. Um, and uh, it was okay. I'm sure it was amazing if you watched it in 93, the year I was born. But watching it 30 years later, it was just okay. It, it was a lot of good stereotypes. It, it, it was cute. You, you yeah, need to watch it. Not a, it's not up for Oscars, Mike. It's a, it, it was it. cute. It was renegade football guys, right? Now I would put it. I mean, like remember the Titans, Rudy, yeah. and then programs like a distant third. Well, Just the pro- I mean, the programs that knock off of Florida State back in those days. That's that's what they did. So that was the. Do you know where they filmed that? Do you know what stadium uh, they filmed that at? Are you kidding? Mike, you know? I do not answer. Do you know type of questions as as we've discussed? So, South Carolina, I'm- South Carolina. <laughs> that is that's a good point, Tim. Um. Boys, piece of the game, Tyler, Jack, because my butt is hurting so bad from sitting in this chair for this long. Yeah, I feel bad for you guys. Yeah, seriously. No, you guys Um, are are heroes. But Tyler and Jack, and and Tim, by the way, we are not recording that Final Thoughts video. We can can link up tomorrow. (laughs) Uh, There's just no way in hell that's happening. But Tyler and Jack, uh, I'll go to Jack first. Just uh, for my my biggest key to the game is the Notre Dame wide receivers getting separation. Um, that uh, that's just me personally because I got scared when I saw that NC State game early on and Notre Dame struggling offensively. I know the weather was bad, but I just think that was a little bit of a blueprint. Jack, what's your take? Yeah, no, I I I kind of agree with you that the NC State game scared me a little bit for Notre Dame offensively, but it it wasn't it was a little bit the receivers. It was more the pass protection. It was I I I, I don't know it. It, particularly on the interior, Mike, Michael Hall Jr. scares me. My, my, Mike Hall, I, I think he goes by now. I, he, he is just such a disruptive pass rusher on the, on the inside. Uh, he, if you watch, watch back the Notre Dame game from last year, he, he killed Notre Dame la, last year. Uh, and he, even on the outside, like Blake Fisher 
he's he's a really really good player. We've seen some of those inconsistencies uh, pop up that that we saw last year that you know are kind of dropping him right now uh, from a, from an easy first round pick to kind of a kind of a second third rounder uh, right now. And th- those have, those have shown up. They showed up at, even against against Tennessee State. They showed up a bit. Uh, and Tui Molowal and Jack Jack Slayer. The sack numbers haven't been there like they haven't been for Notre Dame, but for for Ohio State, like. They have been getting so much pressure at that front four. The their matchups like Notre Dame haven't been really conducive to sack production. They played Indiana, who kind of ran a glorified triple option. It, it, it was weird. Uh, and Western Kentucky, who's just a complete spread team that that doesn't that gets the ball out quickly. But against Notre, Notre Dame, the, the if the Irish want to create those big plays, play action misdirection is a big piece of it to get those pass rushers moving sideways. But they're gonna ha- at some points when the, when that running game isn't working on a specific series, they're gonna have to drop back and throw. And my biggest concern is can the pr- protect protection hold up? And can Sam Hartman secure the ball? We talk about Audric Audric Estime yeah. needing to secure the ball. Sam Hartman has had a, you know th- they've said like we we want him to stop holding that ball in one hand like a loaf of bread. He really needs to do that against this Ohio State front. Yeah, part of the, part of the reason I'm going with receivers is because like. If, if Ohio State's bringing like seven every play, like they're, I mean, and, and Notre Dame has six in protection or, you know, it's, it's all one on one matchups. It, it, it's like, it's very, really difficult, especially against, you know, an Ohio State team that we would think would have a pretty good pass rush. So receivers got to get some separation to have Ohio State not be able to do that. So, um, yeah, good stuff, Jack. Uh, throw it over to Tyler. Yeah, you guys both went offensive side of the ball. So I'll go to the other side of the ball and say just D-line domination for Notre Dame. If they can get that in this game, both in the pass rush and stopping the run, completely different ball game. Uh, and I think there's potential for that. I rewatched the Ohio State offense today, every single snap against Western Kentucky, and I thought there were some moments there where the Ohio State offensive line just wasn't getting a whole lot of push. Like Travion Henderson had a great game, because he's Travion Henderson and he's just a dude making plays against inferior talent on the other side of the ball. Notre Dame has better talent on the defensive side of the ball. So they should be able to corral him in spots that he wasn't getting corralled against uh, Western Kentucky. So like, for example, there was a, I think there was a second and one Travion Henderson up the middle got stuffed third and one they're lining up. They don't know what to call. They had to call a timeout against Western Kentucky. They ended up running it up the middle again Either he got stuffed again and then they just plowed it forward on fourth and one or he barely got the line to gain on third and one. So there's going to be opportunities for Notre Dame to stop the run. Then it becomes a Kyle McCord game in his fourth ever start at Notre Dame Stadium. Place is going to be packed, going nuts. If you can just get pressure on him a couple times. I think hey, this was John's show. Let's let's the John Kennedy. This was the John Kennedy show. Let, let's just call it like it is. And I think he said something about speeding up Kyle McCord's clock. That would be huge in this game. Notre Dame has not been a big sack team this year, but like even if you can just get to him and force him to throw it away or you do get a sack, he was sacked by Western Kentucky in the first quarter of that game. Like I said, I watched that whole game. They got to him. If Notre Dame gets to him, I think it's a completely different mental thing where he's like, this isn't Western Kentucky. This isn't Indiana. This isn't Youngstown State. So for me, I think especially at home, Notre Dame defensive line has has a chance to really kind of set the tone early and, and just – play like that throughout just to add on to Ty's point I I think like the number one thing for me is like if Notre Dame does this they will win this game if the if Notre Dame can get pressure with their front four and with a four-man rush I think I think they win this game if 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 they can't do that like they could they could still play coverage and and hope their corners can hold up for long enough they 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 could they could blitz I and and hope their corners I can can hold up one-on-one like it's a realistic hope it, it just becomes a lot easier for that Notre Dame defense if that front four can get pressure. And if, if that happens, I think Notre Dame can score enough to win. So for folks watching on our YouTube channel, the next time you'll see these two guys, uh, Tyler and Jack, will be um, after the game, they'll do a, a video with them standing up. Um, always a fantastic backdrop that you guys have and talk about the game for eight to ten minutes or so. Um, and that video will probably go up at like three in the morning or something. So that'll be a, that'll be a good time for, for your guys' video editor aka me um but yeah tyler jack i really appreciate you guys for hanging on like an extra 45 minutes uh and, and then you know doing this until 10 30 eastern here so uh tyler jack appreciate you man have a great weekend yeah. guys have a lot of fun thank you for having us on 
All right. Yeah, you get, you guys are the real heroes for being here for three and a half hours. So no, well, it's the eight hundred fifty people in here. All right. Um, okay, next guests. We got another hour, if you can believe it. Can you imagine? <laughs> Three hours, Mike. I mean, we did a 45 minute show, I think, for Tennessee State. So um, you could tell the difference in the atmosphere. But uh, yeah, before we sign off, man, that was, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Who would have thought that we talked, you know, that you talked recruiting and we did all that stuff for the first hour, man? You got blocks like crazy Dude, in this show. I, said, so. I thought two and a half hours we were going to go. So for folks like watching this back, they see how long it is and they're like, or podcasts, like singer said two and a half hours. What the hell happened? Why is it three and a half? So I got and literally Tim, 12 hours and one minute from right now, I will be back on this YouTube channel talking Notre Dame recruiting. Um, I, I got a text from my wife 15 minutes ago saying, Hey, are you home? Are you in the basement watching film? And I'm like, I'm still on. She was like, what? So I was like, we're having fun. I'll be home in 20. So and Tim, you, uh, you can, uh, you know, you can charge, uh, you know, the, the company a little bit more for, for your time tonight. Cause you went over your usual limit rate here. Man, I'll tell you what, though, that, that was fun. That was a blast. That was an unbelievable show. You know what? Everyone watch on the, it's, it was, it's just great talking ball, man. It was unbelievable. Corey, Corey says Driscoll does a three hour plus show. Don't get all high and mighty. Shout out to the guys at Irish Breakdown. Yeah. I don't know how they do this. Wow. I know I, I, I uh, always Irish on Kennedy. Whole do these long shows. I've never done a three and a half hour show. I, that that's this is all. I mean, you can really work on your posture and everything. So, yeah, I mean, three hour shows. At least we have guests and we're bouncing ideas off each other. I don't know how anyone just sits and talks into a camera for three hours all by themselves. I don't get that. But hey, everyone has their own thing. But no, when you got guests and you're rolling things and great flow with John and you know Goolsby just talking ball is awesome. So yeah, well, I mean, that was a hell of a night, man. Hey. 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 Hey, handle business Saturday. We could have a top five battle against USC. Maybe we do this again, correct? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Hell, the Duke game, dude. We'll have to do a huge show for the Duke game next Wednesday. No, seriously, Dukes can be undefeated. I what, know. a top 20 team or something? And yeah. Notre Dame is going to be in the top five? I mean, hell, yeah. There you go, man. It doesn't end. It's going to be one hell of a season handle business on Saturday. All right. Well, yeah, we definitely lived up to the mega show. Um, so that is going to sign us off folks. Okay. So before you go, you please hit the thumbs up because this was a lot of work. We need the thumbs up so I can show my boss in the morning. Like, Hey, look at what this three and a half hour show did for our YouTube channel. So please hit the thumbs up. Of course, subscribe to our channel. If you are new here, uh, we might not have three hour plus shows all the time. Um, but look we have so much content on our youtube channel we do five shows five live shows a week and then a lot of like uh what we call like a segment video where it's shorter but we're talking about some news and uh breaking down some recruits or some analysis or just kind of what's going on in notre dame football and recruiting so definitely lock into our uh, blue and gold uh, youtube channel and of course folks uh blue and gold.com is your home for um, all things notre dame athletics and our current offer right now for new subscribers is a one dollar for a month, or you can sign up for a year. Just take the plunge, and it's half off the normal price. So please uh, go to bloomandgold.com and check that out. You guys have been amazing. Thank you so much for hanging out. Um, that's gonna sign us off. Uh, Tim Hyde, and Mike Singer here. Thank you to all of our guests. Thank you to all of you watching and listening. Appreciate you guys. We'll catch you next time.